uh, in case there are any more questions that we want to uh, go over. Uh, let's talk today's game plan. Again, if you have not taken the attendance quiz, please do that. The access code is LOCK, L-O-C-K. Make sure it's all lowercase uh, when you do that. And again, it's just a quick one question to show that uh, you are in attendance. Um, uh, as far as attendance goes, I have added a couple additional students uh, over the evening. So I think uh, we have uh, everybody who uh, wants to get in, I think, has had the opportunity to get in. Uh, so we'll, we'll see if there's anybody who's still on the wait list, still trying to get in, uh, then uh, see me or talk to me during the break. Uh, but uh, you should have gotten an email from me. I think most of the people who are still here um, and hopefully everybody is uh, still in the process of adding. Uh, let's talk about today's game plan. Uh, today we are going to talk about our first major physiological process or concept and that's homeostasis and that's really one we're going to talk about through all of 430 and 431. And then like I said we're going to start building that foundation we were talking about by uh, talking about chemistry, talking about macromolecules. Uh, in labs, like I said, we're not going to have microscopes that you're going to hold in your hand, but there is a lot of histology you're going to be responsible for. So I want to talk a little bit about what you're responsible for on that. And uh, we can start talking about the anatomy of cells and how you're going to be held responsible for that material. Uh, the assignments due, uh, you have one more assignment due today. If you haven't already done the ones, remember uh, most assignments are due at the beginning of class on the day that it is due. The one exception to that was the Mastery a &P because uh, for waitlisted students who are still trying to add, I wanted to give them the opportunity. I don't want them to have to use their free two week trial uh, to get into Mastery a &P if they're not able to add the class. But I think like I said, we're, I think we're able to add everybody who wants to add. Uh, so we should be okay that way. So uh, use your master name P get on there if you haven't purchased it already. Make sure you do that introductory assignment. It's due by the end of the day today. Uh, then you got a nice whole big long one day weekend and we come back on Thursday. And on Thursday we have a couple assignments that are due. Uh, the first is your first lab simulator. Uh, Labster is a very interactive, uh, engaging uh, lab activity uh, that uh, we're going to be using in this class and you're going to be doing the homeostasis activity. Uh, the link to that is in your modules. Uh, you will do the whole activity, uh, complete 100% of the activity, and I think you have to get 80% uh, correct to uh, pass. Uh, so you'll do that and you need to do that and it's due. Again, that for those of the labsters, it automatically submits it to me into the grade book. So there isn't anything you have to manually submit for that. Uh, but just make sure you have it completed by the time class begins on Thursday. Uh, same thing for Friday as well. Your second labster is going to be due, uh, and that is due at 8 o'clock as well. Again, you can use Wednesday to get both of them done. They're not hard. They're a little bit time consuming, uh, again, because it makes you walk through. It is a lab simulator. You have to put on a lab coat. You have to put on gloves. You have to do those types of activities uh, and do the activities while you're doing that. But it's very engaging, like I said, very interactive, very visual. So hopefully that'll be something that'll be helpful. The other thing that's going to be due is your Unit 3 lab manual review. Uh, unit 3 is on the microscope. As I mentioned, we're not going to be using the microscopes, but you still need to understand the concepts of the microscope, what the microscope is used for, how it works, how it functions. Uh, the review for it is on pages 62 through 68, and notice I have a star next to that, because one of the things, like I said, that I love about our lab manual is it's like a workbook. At the beginning of each sec section is a pre-lab, that kind of is great activities, vocabulary, labeling activities to help you start to learn the information. Then there are activities that you'll be doing in the lab, and then at the end of it is a review. So it has those three parts to it. For whatever reason, for chapter three for the microscopes, they've combined the activities and the review questions. You are only responsible for the review questions. There are 10 of them, and they are at the tops of the pages. There are microscope activities that are gonna be underneath those, and you can do them as a thought experiment, unless you happen to have a microscope at home, then feel free to do them normally. Uh, but you can kind of look at them and see about them and, and understand that. But for whatever reason, and it's the only unit that's like that, so it won't be a big deal, uh, but the review is a part of the activities. It's on the same page as the activities, so that's a little wonky. Uh, but that's due on Friday as well. So again, make sure you're getting your resources for the class. Uh, if you haven't been able to get your lab manual or you've ordered it and it's backlogged, then uh, please let me know and we can see about maybe making other accommodations. But uh, you need to have that lab manual. You need to start working on these things right away. And the first stuff is going to be due on Thursday. All right. So that's the game plan. Questions on any of that?
All right, excellent. Stun silence, always what I love. Let's switch gears then to uh, a couple more housekeeping. Yes, did you have a question? You have to unmute yourself. Everybody. Okay. So yeah. So the question that I have, you said about um, in order to uh, pass with like eighty percent or better, correct? I believe that's what it's set up for. I, I'll have to double check it, but I, I believe eighty percent is correct. Yes. Okay. So if you get, let's say, for example, a sixty, it forces you to redo it, correct? I think to get full credit for it, yes. Again, the, the Labster uh, lab simulator is new for us, so I'm not 100% sure of the mechanisms of how it works. But my understanding is that, um, yes, you would need to then do it again. But but what I will tell you is that it is pretty lenient. I, I, I did I've done all the activities you're doing, I'm doing as well. There are a lot of points in them. Most of the points are pretty simple and straightforward. Every once in a while, you'll get something wrong. But again, 80% is a pretty lenient score on that to be able to do that. So if you get 80%, do you get full credit or do you still you get 80%? As no, you'll get full credit. If you, as, 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 because it is a learning experience, as long as you pass it, the, the goal is to pass it. To pass it, you have to do 100% of the activities and you have to get a score of 80% or better on that. And if you do that for the completing the activity, you will get full credit. Oh, okay. All right, great. Okay. Uh, See, so yeah, that was the question. Yeah, I, I, I had heard that as well. The lab manual at the bookstore I have heard is back ordered. I have talked to them about that. If you're having trouble getting it, uh, remember you also have the opportunity to rent the book uh, through Chegg. So again, for those of you who are having issues, I remember Chegg is a pretty good website where you can order the book that way. So that is an alternative way of ordering it. Uh, but like I said, if you do use Chegg, you will strong, I would strongly encourage you to find some type of histology uh, atlas because like I said, we are going to be doing a lot of microscope stuff, especially in this first part when we get to tissues uh, and skin. Uh, those are going to be things that will use the histology atlas a lot. So uh, that is a way to do that. If, if, if you've made, purchased an order and it's back ordered, then like I said, maybe if you, uh, we can work something out, email me. Uh, and then if, uh, if you email me your receipt that it's back ordered or something, then maybe I can, I can uh, 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 not mark you off for being late on the assignment. So we'll figure something out, but we do wanna make sure you guys get that stuff as soon as possible. All right. Uh, Michelle, do you have a question? You're, you're uh, muted as well. You have to unmute your mic. Michelle, if you're trying to talk to us, we still can't hear you. You have to unmute your microphone. So if you look on the screen, typically down in the bottom left, there's a microphone. If you uh, click that. Or you can type it in the chat if you're having trouble talking. Oh, yeah. Yeah, ah, yeah. There yeah. you if, go. If Perfect. OK. Uh, I have a question uh, because um, I haven't got my mastering uh, AMP now. Uh, it, it would be um, coming uh, it, uh, at the day, maybe. Uh, so can I uh, postpone the, the, um, uh, this homework to uh, uh, tomorrow? It's okay. Well, uh, remember, for the mastering AMP, when you log on, you can also get a, three, a free two-week trial. Oh, so. really? Oh, okay, okay. I will try it. Yep, so here, and actually that's one of the things that I wanted to, that there was some more housekeeping stuff we wanted to do. Let me, uh, let me fix this, change this view. Okay. Yep, when you go to the My Lab and Mastering, when you click on the link for it, uh, to open it, it will give you the option of signing up for a free two-week trial. So what you can do is uh, sign up for your free two-week trial, and then once you get the code, you'd enter the code to do it that way. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank the other, you. The other thing that I want to be here on Canvas for to show you, because I think I rushed through it a little bit, so I want to make sure there's some clarification on this. There's some, like I said, some more housekeeping issues I wanted to deal with. Uh, the first is the submission of your homework assignments. Uh, your homework assignments, so like we said, your unit one review, when it's due, you're going to go to the modules. In the modules, here is our section. Notice this is also where you'll go to do the labster activities and things along the physio X, all of those activities as well. But up here are the assignments. If you're not sure of what, what an assignment is, you can click on that assignment. All right, it tells you what it is, pages 29 through 36 in the lab manual. 
Uh, and then what you can do is you can basically do it one of two ways. If you have the physical copy, uh, then you just fill it out by hand. You can then either scan it or you can even take pictures of it with your phone. Uh, and if you get the electronic version, you can print those pages out, do it by hand, or you can fill it out electronically if you'd like. But once you do that, you are then going to come to the assignment, go to the submit assignment, and you are going to upload the file here, either the pictures uh, or the PDF or however it is that you're going to submit it this way. Uh, one of the important things to remember about this, one of the nice things about this is because you are logged into Canvas, when you submit assignments, these assignments are going to be submitted into a folder that is specific for you. So while it's always important to remember to put your names on things, I know that when I see it, I see it in a folder specifically for you. So I know it is you that submitted that. Okay. Now, um, okay, just you. a quick question. When you're submitting it, I'm assuming if you have like five, six, seven pages, you keep adding files. And once you have all of them, then you submit, correct? That is, yes, you can do it that way. Absolutely. For the interviews, uh, that is totally acceptable. Notice you're able to do that and you can submit them all at once. However, the other thing, and again, it wouldn't be so much for the unit one review. So let's instead go back to the modules. So I want to leave. Uh, Patricia, I see your question. I'll get to it in just a second. So hold on, but I wanted to finish this first. So for instance, remember one of the things that I said is we have the Physio X exercise uh, that's going to be due on the 16th and it is five different activities. Again, these activities are not hard, but they are uh, a little time consuming. So if you notice, I've submitted one already. So I just did the first activity. If I'd want to do the first activity today and the second activity tomorrow, what I can do is I can submit them one at a time. So I can resubmit and then add the second one. And again, if you would want to submit them all five at once, you can do that. If you want to do it one at a time, just hitting, just hit resubmit. I know resubmit sounds scary, but you're not erasing your original submissions. So you're just adding to what is already there. So you can do them all at once or you can do them one at a time. Either way is a fine way to submit the exercises. Uh, for the lab bundle, are we able to get both of them from Chegg and, and just the ebook? Uh, so from Chegg, I don't, you know, actually, I'll be honest, I have not looked at Chegg to see if they have a histology atlas. I don't know if they have a histology atlas. What I do know is if they do, it would be a separate purchase. They're not bundled together the same way the textbook stuff is. Uh, but uh, most of the stuff you get at Chegg, you're renting anyway. So I don't, I, I don't know actually the difference in prices for those things. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and again, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't, a histology atlas is really nice. There may be electronic versions. There may be online ones. There may even be free ones that you may be able to find. And if you find some really good ones, let me know and I'll, I'll make those offers. I'll, I'll, I'll make other people aware of it as well. All I know is that we're going to do a lot of histology. And like I said, having really good examples of these things is going to be something that's going to be really helpful. In fact, one of the places that I, I've already made available for you, if you go back to the modules, uh, in the modules, notice under the study tools, this Yale histology site is really, really excellent. Uh, when I was, uh, so this site has a lot of great histology on it. So when you go to this site, uh, you'll see that there is a tremendous amount of histology, really, really good uh, materials here. So this is a site that is pretty good for histology as well. Uh, so again, there are different places where you can go to get some of this. I've tried to provide some things that I think are useful, but having that tool, again, there's no assignment specifically that's going to be coming out of it. But having that tool is something that is going to be very helpful for you uh, when you are trying to master this material and prepare for the exam, especially the first one. And the nervous system. The nervous system and, 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 uh, and this first test probably have the most histology. In it. There's a little bit of histology in the bones, a little bit of it in the muscles, but the nervous and, the, uh, and this introductory one has a lot. Hi, Professor. Um, I have a question. Uh, yeah. When I get in the uh, um, lab lab account, uh, what username uh, uh, I I have to use? 
So for the mastering, you, if, if you have ever used any mastering before, like if you use mastering chemistry or mastering physics or any of those other Pearson mastering sites, then you already have a username and password. Otherwise, when you do it, you'll set up a, a new one. So you'll just set up a new username and password if you've never used any of the Pearson mastering stuff before. Okay. But okay. it's a different username and password than what you use for, uh, for the for long can, can I create a uh, new one? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. But but I uh, when I try, I, I can't get it. Okay, I well, like I said, maybe after class, it's something we can help, I can help you with and we can work on that then, okay? Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so again, both on Chegg, I know Chegg has got the lab manual. I don't believe it has the textbook. I don't know if it has a histology atlas. Um, the websites with the, uh, the, the, the websites, remember all the websites are here under study tools and the modules. Those are websites that I have, including the link to our YouTube site is here as well. And the link to the open lab. Uh, if you purchase the eText bundle, yes, the photographic atlas comes with it. They do have both atlases on Chegg and also the lab manual uh, ebook. Limited 50 pages printing, histology ebook. All right, so there you go. So there are some of those on there. Um, I uh, unfortunately no, I'm not able to provide scans of the of the uh, lab manual. I've actually talked to the Ammerman before about trying to get PDFs of the first couple of units while people worked with their things and they refused to let us to do that. So uh, I cannot provide you with that. Uh, one of the things that I will uh, point out to you, again, I'm not encouraging this behavior, uh, but what I will remind you is there is a discussion board uh, and there's a water cooler here. If yeah. someone wanted to communicate you through that uh, to talk to somebody about possibly getting them to send them the PDFs of the pages, I would be no part of that. Uh, but uh, uh, Ammerman or, or Morton, who does it, has told us that I'm not allowed to provide those PDFs. So I cannot provide those PDFs. But um, but there, you know, if you, if you want to communicate with each other as students and work something out while you're getting those things, okay. that's between you guys. All right. Okay. All righty. Excellent. So we still have a couple more housekeeping things I wanted to do, and for that, let's go. Where to go? Here. A couple more quick things. Uh, most of you have completed your lab safety forms, but there's still a few people who have not. And there's still a couple people who submitted it, but submitted it as blanks and re need to uh, resubmit it again. Remember, you need to either print it as a PDF or save it as a separate file uh, to be able to load it up on there. If you got your 10 points and it was done correctly, if you got zero points for it, you did not do it correctly and you should have gotten a note from me. And obviously, if you haven't done it, you need to do it. Um, there are only a few things you have to do to be a part of this class. And for whatever reason, this is one of them. They are requiring us to do this lab safety form. If you do not complete this lab safety form, you cannot participate in this class. So please make sure you get that done. Uh, I already just finished talking about submitting the homework. So we did that already because we were on uh, Canvas. Uh, there are a couple things. Again, I talked about this in the last class, but I know uh, repetition is an important thing. So there are some important things to make sure uh, that you are doing on the quizzes. Uh, again, I want to emphasize it again. You need to slowly scan your entire immediate workspace. I want to see down. I want to see your desk. I want to see what's behind your computer, underneath your table, on your desk. I don't care what's in the corner of your room or the poster you have on the wall or your ceiling fan. Those aren't the things that I'm interested in. I have to see your working space that you have here to make sure it is clear of all materials. All right? And again, if you don't do that, you will lose 10%. Uh, on a real exam. Again, I didn't dock anybody for the practice because that's the point, practice and learning. It's also important to be careful about your lighting. Uh, make sure you're not too backlit. If you have a really bright window behind you, it makes you really dark. And again, you have that image of yourself on the screen. You know what you look like. If you're completely black faced because of the bright light behind you, uh, then that's not an acceptable way of taking the exam. Again, the proctorio system and me when I'm having to watch these stupid things, I have to make sure that I can see you clearly while you're doing this. 
Uh, also, it is important to stay centered on the screen. I had a whole lot of exams that were going on like this that isn't necessarily very helpful, right? Or when you're off the side of the screen like this, make sure you are on screen. And again, you have that image so that you're able to see that. And lastly, one of those things I never thought I would have to say, you know, kind of like, you know, it, it, that's one of the fun things about this class. I never thought I used to have to say to use a, two, a number two pencil when you're filling out Scantrons. And then a couple of years ago, I had not one, but two students use a pen. So now I have to say, make sure you use a pencil on a Scantron when we're in the class. Well, this is something else I never thought I'd have to say, but here I am saying it. When you're taking the exam, do not cover up your camera, right? I had a, several people who showed their ID, scanned their room, and then covered the camera. <laughs> that completely defeats the purpose of being proctored. I appreciate being proctored does seem odd. It is, gonna, it is weird and does take some getting used to. Uh, but the good news is you got a lot of exams, so you will get used to it. Uh, and unfortunately, the same way that I, in the classroom, sit there and have to observe you, um, I need to observe you during the exam as well to make sure we need to maintain the integrity of this class. And this is the, unfortunately, the rules that are in place to have to do this. So I apologize for that, but these are what are necessary for us to be able to successfully have this class online. If we can't proctor the exam, if we may, can't maintain the integrity of the exam, uh, then, um, then unfortunately uh, we can't complete this class successfully. So I do apologize for that, but that is important. All right, last little bit. I did, for the most part, read most of the student info sheets that were completed, except for the ones that were done late last night. And again, there are some uh, interesting information and some other things that I want to address. Again, not surprisingly, primarily nursing students, although I was surprised. We have a very wide range of uh, interests in this class, everything from pre-med and PAs to uh, bio majors and kinesiology. And so uh, it's got a nice diversity. That should be pretty fun for this class. I think it's going to be good. Uh, you guys, for the most part, were pretty non-committal. You want to know everything about biology or physiology or anatomy or things like that. Although there were some people for cells and bones and muscles, somebody for heart, but you're going to have to wait for 431 for that one. Again, I mentioned this in the last class, but I want to mention it again. A fair number of you said yes, that you were taking other summer school classes. And again, I want to emphasize how much time this class takes. Your success in this class is going to be based almost exclusively, 100% on how much time you have studying it. And my concern for you is if you're taking other Southern school classes, even if they're quote unquote easy classes, sometimes those easy classes are still very time dependent. They have a lot of busy work and they keep you busy and they spend a lot of time. And any time you spend not studying for this class is, you know, has the potential of hurting you in this class. So again, I want to strongly encourage you uh, to consider uh, just making uh, me and this class your entire life focus for the next X week, eight weeks. All right. Uh, Several people asked questions about grades in this class. Again, I kind of talked about what that is. What I can tell you is that uh, the math, uh, typically, what I would say is that in a typical semester, uh, the average grade in my anatomy and physiology class is about a 78, uh, and, but with easily half of the students to getting A's and B's. Again, that number is a little inflated because remember, the class like this tends to have a fair amount of, um, uh, of uh, attrition where people drop that aren't necessarily going to be successful. And so that does tend to boost a little bit. But like I said, this is the first time we're doing it online. Uh, I will uh, be, again, because this is a learning experience for me as well as it is for you as necessary, I will curve the grades or do other things as necessary to help us to be successful. Uh, but again, your grade in this class is gonna be based on your points and your merits in this class. Uh, as we talked about, uh, I do provide study guides for uh, material, uh, especially in for the lab material, uh, when necessary. The lecture outlines I consider to be my study guides for the lectures. Uh, I'm not a huge proponent of study guides, because uh, especially for the lecture part, because what I found is that if I provide a study guide, all students do is study the study guide. And so if there's something that's on the exam that's not on the study guide, they get all angry. And so what that means is then I have to write every single thing that I put into the lecture onto the study guide, and then I'm just rewriting my lectures. The important rule of thumb is you are responsible for everything we talk about in this class, right? Now, when we get, for instance, to the bones, 
right? Every single bone in your body you were responsible for, we talked about. And every single bone in your body probably has a dozen different features that have names on it. Because if we learn anything, it's anatomists love to name things. When you look through your atlas, every single bone you'll see has a dozen bone features on it. Right? In that case, when we get to the bones, I will give you a specific list. For this bone, you only need to know these three things. And for this bone, you only need to know these six things. And for this bone, maybe there are no bone features you need to know. You just need to know the bone. So when necessary, I will give you a specific list of the material for the lab exam. You will have a very concrete study guide so you know exactly what you're responsible for from the lab component of this. But for lecture, you're responsible for everything. All right. Um, again, extra credit opportunities like the five for five. I will do those throughout the semester as a way to do those touch tones to see so that you can ask questions and I can see how you're doing and we can talk about things and doing that. We just finished the first one and we'll have the next one probably in a couple weeks. Uh, there may be other extra credit opportunities, uh, but again, all of it is going to involve in class things or things related to the class. I do not assign outside extra credit. The only really outside extra credit is that open lab. And again, I want to remind you of that open lab. It starts tomorrow. So tomorrow, Jeff Chingaris will be there uh, so that you can go anytime during that time, check in with him uh, and start working on the cells. You should have some cell models and he can work you through those things and talk about those things and you can get a sense of what that is. So I strongly encourage you to take some time tomorrow. He's there for a long time. I think it was 10.30 to 8.30 or something like that. I don't remember exactly, uh, but uh, he is a great resource and a great tool, and I encourage you to take advantage of him that way. Uh, how do we get there? Is it through Canvas? Uh, so, it, well, it's going to be Zoom, but here, let's, uh, I'll show you again. Uh, discussion board, here we go. So under, again, under modules, because modules are where you're going to find most of your stuff. Under study tools, here is the open lab information. So again, this is his quote. Uh, it is Wednesdays from 10.30 to 8.30. And then I actually have the link because he's got a permanent class, kind of like I have my permanent class. So you just click that link and it takes you to the open lab. So it's right there in the modules. That's the easiest way to get to it. And notice it's a page as well. But the module, so you can get to it from the pages when you view all the pages. There's the open lab page and then you but you can also get there through the modules as well and you said the maximum is 15 points 15 hours yes correct? but like i said don't just go for 15 hours and stop go getting 15 points from doing the um getting 15 points from doing the open lab is useful but if you actually use it as a learning tool as a study tool you'll get far more than 15 points out of the exams because you'll master the material so much better and you'll do so much better on the exams that you won't even need those 15 points of extra credit. So go. I encourage everybody to go and go frequently and go often uh, because Jeff, like I said, is a great resource. Uh, he is a wonderful instructor, really. He's a, he just finished his master's last year. Uh, he's looking for teaching positions. He started teaching more and more. Unfortunately, we will lose him eventually because he's an amazing resource. Uh, so take advantage of him while we have him. All right, uh, fall schedule. Um, my understanding from what Los Rios said a couple weeks ago is that their expectation is that fall will be completely online again. Uh, there is some minor flexibility in if things improve greatly, that there may be an opportunity to move labs and things like that onto campus. But uh, as of right now, my understanding is that the school's policy is that we will be online again in the fall. I don't know uh, how written in stone that is, but I do know that that is, that is the current game plan. So for those of you who have asked, uh, that, is what, uh, that is what I know. You know mostly what I do. They had made a public statement a couple weeks ago that they were going completely online, but I know other schools have said the same thing and then backed off. So I don't know if Los Rios would do the same thing. But my understanding right now is that fall will be online. All right. And yes, I do have a 431 in the fall as well. I have one of each, 430 and a 431. Last and least important, uh, a couple of people asked about my information. Uh, I've been teaching at American River College for 14 years now. I've been with the Los Rios School District for almost 20 years. Uh, and uh, I have been, um, I did both my graduate and undergraduate at UC Davis, uh, where I got my PhD in neuroscience, studying the development of the visual system. 
So, uh, so when we get to the nervous system, that is my wheelhouse. That's uh, where I uh, cut my teeth. And so that is that. All right. Questions on any of that? All right, excellent. That is it for the housekeeping. I promise I won't continue to take a half an hour of our time before we dive into things. But again, these first couple days, we have to get all this housekeeping stuff out of the way. So now we finally get to the fun stuff. So as everybody grabs their pen and starts furiously writing, uh, we can talk about our first major physiological process, and that is homeostasis. As you can see here, homeostasis is a condition of equilibrium in the body's internal environment produced by the ceaseless interplay of all the body's regulatory processes. I know that sounds incredibly impressive, so it's important to write that down so you can call grandma on the phone and say, hey grandma, guess what? Homeostasis is a condition of equilibrium in the body's internal environment produced by the ceaseless interplay of all the body's regulatory processes. And grandma will be impressed and she'll send you $20 in the mail. <laughs> Now, while that may be a useful piece of information, we can take this concept and distill it down into something much more simple. Basically, homeostasis is dynamic stability. What does it mean to be dynamic? Changing. Yeah, constantly changing. What does it mean to be stable? Homeo. Well, stable. stable means not changing, right? So it's dynamic means changing. Stability means not changing. So what does that mean? How can we have dynamic stability? Well, it really is a good definition of what homeostasis is. And let's think of it in a practical terms. Give me an example of a physiological concept of the body that we maintain in homeostasis. Heart rate, blood pressure. Heart rate, excellent. Blood pressure. Body temperature. Body temperature, excellent. Let's take that one. If I were to take your body temperature right now, what would it be? 96. Yeah, every single person, absolutely. All of you stick a thermometer in your mouth right now, and every single one of you is going to be precisely at 98.6 right now, right? Oh. No, probably not. Absolutely not, right? Now, maybe one of us is going to be at 98.6, and let's say for argument's sake you are. But what about 15 minutes from now, as you've been sitting here full, slowly falling asleep listening to the, the tones of my voice? What's your temp is your temperature going to be exactly 98.6 then? Uh, be within no. one or two degrees. Yeah, well, but again, but it's not going to be the same. It's going to be maybe 97, right, 0.4. And then maybe coming back from the break, it's going to be 98.3. And then maybe a little bit later, it's going to be, you know, 97.9. It is dynamic. It is constantly changing, right? Whether you just had something hot to drink or you were moving around or you've been sitting or you're getting cold or the air conditioning comes on, it is dynamic. It is constantly changing. But if we take your temperature, is it ever going to be 84 degrees? Or is it going to be 114 degrees when I take no, it 20 no. minutes from now or an hour from now? No. While it is dynamic, it is dynamic within a very narrow, stable range, right? So it's constantly changing, but it's constantly changing within a very narrow, stable range. And that's that stability. So it really is a dynamic stability. It is constantly changing, but within a restrictive range that is optimal for our living conditions. Is, yeah, that, this same thing like, is that the same thing like the pH in the body? Yeah, pH in the body, all, everything. Everything we maintain with homeostasis uses this dynamic stability. Heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, all of these things use this dynamic stability. And again, and it's not just the body. Again, you not, haven't thought of it in these terms, but you, uh, oops, but you understand these concepts. Right, Because, for instance, right now, you're inside of a house, most likely, and that house has, uh, in all likelihood now, because they're taking over the world, you have a Nest Smart Thermostat. Right? Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean five years ago, you had a choice. You could have your uh, heater on, or you could have your air conditioner on. Right, but no, not, not with our smart thermostats now. With your smart thermostat, you set a range of values that you want your house to be in. And if the temperature goes above that, the AC comes on and brings it down. If the temperature goes below that, then the heater comes on and comes up. My sister, when she was pregnant, 
her range on her smart thermostat was 72 degrees. It had to be precisely 72 degrees. If it was more than 72 degrees in her house, uh, she was sweating. If it was below 72 degrees, she was shivering. So her range was 72. She had a pretty tight range, but it's that exact same kind of concept. We have a range where it can change. You open the refrigerator, you open a door, you turn on the oven, there are gonna be minor changes that take place, but it stays within a stable range. And of course, I've already given it away, but answer the question for me. What do we use to regulate this process? Right? If you remember back to when we talked about our organ systems, we had two organ systems that were specialized for communication. What were they again? Nervous system. Nervous system. And, and what was endocrine. the other one? Endocrine. Endocrine system. There you go. It's our nervous system yeah. and our endocrine system. These are what we do to, what we use to uh, regulate this process of homeostasis, either our nervous system or our endocrine system, those two organ systems that are specialized for communication. Now, for this to occur, there are components necessary to be able to maintain balance, right? Um, Normally, this is when we're sitting in the classroom. Again, I'm have to come up with all different analogies now because these don't work anymore. Normally, I'd be sitting in the classroom and I would say, you know, how would your behavior change if someone was breaking into your house right now? And of course, a couple people would say, you know, they'd be upset or they'd be angry. But if you're sitting there in the classroom with me, do you actually, are you actually aware that someone is breaking into your house? Right? If I was blowing a dog whistle right now, Right? If my wife was sitting over here on the bed blowing the dog whistle, would anybody be aware of that? Would that change anybody's behavior here in this class? No. No, because you wouldn't no. be aware of it. The first thing that has to happen if we are going to maintain balance is we have to be aware that a change has taken place. We need what is known as a receptor. That receptor perceives information. Its job is then to send that information to our control center. Our control center is where the decision is made. Basically, in our control center, a couple things happen. It receives the information, and then it processes that information. That processing involves basically uh, comparing the info to what we know. And then once we do that, we make a decision. And we make that decision on what we are going to do, how we are going to influence that change. Once we make that decision, that information gets sent to an effector. And an effector is what basically is going to influence the change with the goal of bringing it back into balance. We just talked about a really simple example of this. All right. We just talked about a really simple example. With that simple example, um, we have a window open in the house. That is our disturbance. The first thing that happens. Our disturbance is our upsetting the balance. Something upsets the balance. Then we need something that is going to receive that information. In this case of the house, it's the, your thermo thermometer. There's a thermometer that has a sensor that receives that information. It sends that information to our command center. In this case, the command center is that thermostat. This thermostat says you wanted your house at 72 degrees. And right now the house is at 71. It is out of balance, right? So it compares what we know, what we want it to be with what is actually going on. And it makes a decision. We're out of balance, we have to affect a change. Notice it's not the thermostat that brings the house back into balance though. It sends that information to the effector. And again, the effector as the name indicates is what is going to affect the change with the job of bringing it back into balance. So the control center tells the furnace to turn on, hot air comes in and it brings it back into balance. Simple concept, something we deal with every single day. And it works the same for you too, right? 
Again, I know it's supposed to be summer right now, but it's been pretty brisk up here where I'm at, so I assume it's the same for you as well. So first thing in the morning, you step outside in your pajamas to get your newspaper, all right? And the door locks behind you. And the problem is you don't wear pajamas. So there you are naked on the front porch, right? And it's chilly outside. So what happens, right? Oops, wrong button. You're outside and it's cold. We have sensors in our skin, those receptors that are in our skin that perceive that change in temperature. It sends that signal to our command center. That command center is our brain. That brain makes a decision based on that information and it sends that information to our effector. And in this case, and I'm gonna cheat and steal a little of the screen over here. So we can talk a teeny bit more about effectors. Again, remember the job of the effectors are to influence the change to bring us back into balance. And not, anything, not everything in our body can be effectors. One of the effectors, as we can see here, is skeletal muscle. That skeletal muscle makes us shiver, and that shivering brings our body temperature back up. What else besides skeletal muscle can be an effector that's going to bring our body back into balance? Goosebumps. All right, excellent. What, any idea what causes those goosebumps? What makes your hair stand up and gives you those goosebumps? Well, it turns out they're tiny little muscles that are attached to your hairs. Now, can I voluntarily make them stand on end? Rise. No, they're not standing up. So it's not skeletal muscle. So what kind of muscle makes your hair stand up on end? Anyone know? Smooth muscle. Smooth muscle, excellent. The smooth muscle can be an effector. What else can be an effector? Well, Blood yes. vessels. Say again? Blood vessels. Blood vessels, which also have smooth muscle in it as well. So again, if we instead of standing outside naked, ran around the room 16 times, those would dilate. That would be smooth muscle. That would bring our uh, blood to the surface to help us to dissipate heat. Well, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, is there any other type of muscle? Cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle can also be an effector. Right? Like I said, if you ran around the room 16 times, not only would your blood vessels dilate with the smooth muscle, but your heart would beat faster as well to pump more blood. And one more thing can be an effector. All three types of muscles can be an effector. What's the fourth thing that can be an effector? Glands. Again, say again? Glands. Perfect. There you go. Glands. Again, if you use that example of instead of getting cold, getting hot, running around the room 16 times, you would sweat. So these four things, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands, those are the effectors of the body. Those are the things that are going to influence the changes that are going to bring us back into balance. All right? And again, it works both directions. As you can see here from the pretty picture from your textbook, we get cold, we perceive that information, we shiver, we get hot, we receive that information, we send a signal to our sweat glands and we get uh, sweaty and again, it brings our body back into balance. Just like those smart thermometers, right? This is our dynamic stability. In your house, you have the dynamic stability, right? Temperature goes up, the air conditioner turns on and brings it back down. Temperature gets too low, the heater turns on and it brings it back up. Same thing here. Temperature goes up, we start sweating and it brings the temperature back down. If we get too low, you're gonna shiver and it brings it back up. Again, this concept of homeostasis is this dynamic stability. That's our goal is to maintain that dynamic stability. All right? And again, to completely beat the dead horse, uh, here we have another example, again, that shows all of the steps in the process, right? We have a disruption, right? That's the first step. Step one, we have a disruption. 
right? And that disruption changes our balance. Of course, again, if uh, we are not aware of it, then we can't affect some change. So the next thing we have to do is we have to have a receptor that perceives that information, sends it to the control center, where either the nervous system or the endocrine system, where we process that information, make a decision on that information, and then send a signal to our effector, which influences the change and brings us back into balance. So we're cold, our skin notes that, we send a signal to our brain, our brain sends a signal to our skeletal muscle, and we start shivering. And do we continue to shiver then from then to the end of time? Once you start shivering from your cold, being cold, are you shivering for the rest of your life? No. No, no. no exactly. So there is, has to be <clears throat> constant monitoring of this. And that constant monitoring, it's not really a linear process like this. It's partially linear, but along with that linearity is what we call a feedback loop. And feedback loops come in two flavors. What are the two flavors of feedback loops you can have? Negative and positive. Excellent. Negative feedbacks and positive feedbacks. Excellent. They come in two flavors of our feedback loops to cont continuously monitor this so that once our body temperature gets back to normal, we can stop shivering. Now, luckily, negative and positive are term. Go ahead. Was there a question? Okay. Our uh, concepts I understand. Negative, of course, is bad and positive is good. Yes? Is that how that works? Yep. Well, in some cases, but not necessarily in this case. You are, we are correct. There are two types of feedback, negative and positive. But uh, what they mean in this case by negative is they really mean to negate. Right? If you negate something, you cancel it. Right? Uh, this is, again, normally when I'm in the classroom, I don't have, uh, I don't have my yardstick anymore. How disappointing. Oh, we'll go back to our mighty pencil we talked about last time. Again, this is all about balance. If I'm trying to balance this pencil on my hand and it starts to fall to my right, then if I want to maintain balance, I have to cancel that disturbance and bring it back to the left. If it starts to fall to the left, I have to cancel that disturbance and bring it back to the right. And that is what we mean by a negative feedback. Negative feedback negates, cancels, or reverses the original stimulus. In fact, all the examples we talked about are examples of negative feedback. You get hot from running around the room, you sweat, right? Body temperature goes up, we sweat to bring it down. You go outside and get cold, you shiver to cancel that and bring it back up. Not surprisingly, most of our, and I guess I should write that here, most of our feedback processes use negative feedback for monitoring and maintaining homeostasis. Of course, what's the key with most? Not all. It's not all, absolutely. There are some positive feedback systems. And with a positive feedback system, we are enhancing the original stimulus, right? So it's adding to it. Again, if I try to stick with my analogy of balancing my pencil, if my pencil starts to fall to my right, it doesn't make sense that I could bring it in balance by making it go more to the right, right? It almost seems like the analogy would fall apart that way. But what if instead, if it's fallen to the right, I swing it all the way back around and bring it up, all right? So that's kind of what we're doing here. We're enhancing this. There are fewer examples of these in the body, but there are some pretty famous ones that are common ones that people are familiar with. Can anyone give me an example of a positive feedback uh, system in our body? Having a baby. Having a baby is excellent. That is definitely one of them. Labor, there you go. Labor is a classic example of a positive feedback process. Basically what happens, late term in pregnancy, baby's head is down facing towards the cervix and baby pushes against the cervix and that causes the cervix to stretch. That stretch is a disturbance, right? That stretch sends a signal to the brain and the brain releases a hormone called oxytocin. And oxytocin causes the uterus to contract. And when the uterus contracts, it pushes baby harder against the cervix and the cervix stretches more. 
A bigger stretch sends a bigger signal to the brain and the brain releases more oxytocin and we get a stronger contraction, pushing baby harder, bigger signal, more oxytocin, bigger contraction. Notice each time it's getting bigger and bigger, each time it's getting enhanced until finally baby is expulsed, right? Mom's body is back into balance. Life is no longer in balance, but mom's body is back into balance, right? What's another good example? There's at least one more good one. There's really two more good ones that most people are aware of. What's the next one? Diabetes? No, not Insulin? a bad guess. Diabetes is the opposite, is where we have trouble maintaining uh, homeostasis. What's another example of a positive feedback? Anyone know? Is it maybe if you get like a cut or something? Or no? Exactly what it is. There you go. Uh, clotting. Blood clotting, absolutely. What happens is I cut my finger. And that injured tissue releases a chemical signal and it brings platelets to the area. Platelets attach to the site where the injury is. And when it attaches to the site of the injury, uh, they release their own chemical. And that chemical attracts even more platelets. And they attach and release even more chemicals, which brings even more platelets to the area, which attach. And it keeps coming more and more and more platelets club until boom. A big, huge clump of platelets have formed. You have now a platelet plug, and you stop bleeding as a result of it. So again, notice in both of those cases, we have a disturbance and we're enhancing it. But remember, the important thing about this is that the goal of both is the same. The goal of both, whether you're using a positive or a negative feedback process, is the goal is to bring the body back into balance. And that is our goal of both. The goal of both positive and negative feedback processes is to bring the body back into balance. All right. And again, I have used a couple examples and because we like beating dead horses, here are a couple more. Again, here is another great example. This one is the negative feedback uh, for uh, blood pressure. Blood pressure goes up. We have a dilation of the blood vessels from having more pressure in it. That stretch of the blood vessels sends the signal to the brain and the brain sends a signal to the heart to beat less hard. So that less blood is being moved out and blood pressure drops. And then we already talked about the example of childbirth. So we have that childbirth with the positive feedback where we keep enhancing the stimulus, stretching the cervix more and more and more to get the body back into balance. Because that's our goal. Our goal is to get the body back into balance. And the good news is we're pretty darn good at it. The bad news is we're not perfect, All right? And that's the problem. Homeostatic imbalances, if we're not able to maintain homeostasis, that disruption can lead to disease and even to death. Now, when diagnosing homeostatic imbalances, we are looking for disorders and we are looking for diseases, All right? If I have an upset tummy, is that a disorder or a disease? Disorder. Disorder. Excellent, right? So everybody says disorder, perfect. Uh, what about if I have, um, someone mentioned diabetes mellitus. If I have diabetes mellitus, is that a disorder or a disease? Disease. Everybody agree that's a disease? Yeah, it's a disease. Yes. Okay, excellent. What if I have hepatitis? Is hepatitis a disorder or a disease? A disorder? Disorder. One says disease? Disease. No, it's a disease. All right, excellent. Now I've got half and half. That's more what I was looking for. Well, here's the trick. Hepatitis actually means what? Inflammation of the inflammation. liver. The inflammation. Inflammation of the liver, absolutely. Now, what makes this one a tricky question is one of the things that can cause that uh, inflammation of the liver is a particular virus, like hepatitis B or hepatitis C. If I had hepatitis B or C, that would definitely be a disease. But I just said hepatitis. Maybe I have hepatitis because I've been drinking vodka for breakfast, lunch, and dinner because I've been home with my kids for 90 straight days. Right? So again, inflammation of the liver is actually a disorder, whereas something like hepatitis B or C would actually be a disease. 
Now, when diagnosing disorders and diseases, you are looking for signs and symptoms. Signs are going to be objective and symptoms are subjective. What does it mean to be objective? What does objective mean? Visible. Oh, I like that. That's actually a really great way of describing that. I like that. What do you mean by visible? Uh, something that we see from the patient. For example, uh, you can document that a patient looks jaundiced, yellowness in its eyes. I like that. All right. Absolutely. A sign is something that can be perceived by somebody else. Absolutely. I like that. Uh, and again, one example would be jaundice. One example would be taking someone's temperature, right? Or taking someone's blood pressure. Those would be things that are signs. Whereas again, if I said I had an upset tummy, right, that would be something that would be subjective. Now, again, notice I like that that it can be observed from someone. I love that. That's a great definition. One of the things you have to be careful with is people often think objectives are things that can be given a value. And that's not always the case, because if you think about it, one of the things that happens when you go into the doctor's office is they have those line of smiley faces on the board from the really happy smiley face to the crying face, you know, and it's a scale of one to seven. And they ask you, what is your pain level? And they say five or they say two. That is a value, but is that necessarily something that's objective? No, 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 no that's subjective. Because again, for me, a hangnail may be a six and a half. Whereas for you, right, being much more studlier than I am, a broken arm is a 1.2. Right. So again, that those that so just because you can put a number on it doesn't necessarily mean it's objective. I like that definition a lot. Something that's objective, a sign is something that somebody else can see or observe. I like that. I like that a lot. Excellent. And of course, when we're talking about signs and symptoms, uh, they can be local or they can be systemic. And of course, local means what does local mean? Localized in a certain sure. part of the body. Yeah, just in one part of the body, right? When class is over today, you're going to be super excited because you don't have to listen to my voice for a day and a half. I right? don't have to listen to it for Thursday. So you go outside skipping around your backyard. And as you're skipping around your backyard, you roll your ankle. An hour later, it's going to be the size of a grapefruit. But has it changed the size of your hand at all? No. No. So again, that would be something that is local. Whereas, and especially this is especially true for little kids. When little kids get a fever, Right, it's everywhere. Every part of their body is just, you know, baking. You could fry eggs on their backs and on their shoulders and on their arms uh, because they get that systemically all over the place. All right. One last important major cause of homeostatic imbalances. There are diseases, there are disorders, but there is one other major cause of a homeostatic imbalance. And what is that? Aging. Say again. Uh, aging. Absolutely correct, absolutely. Aging, right? In fact, that's how we define aging. Aging is the progressive decline in ability to restore homeostasis, right? Give me an example. Immune system. Immune system, absolutely, right? Typically, we're able to, uh, when we're younger, uh, or, or mature adults, I should say, we're better able to handle things like the flu, flu or the coronavirus. Coronavirus, uh, the elderly have been much more susceptible to it because they have more of a weakened immune system. Give me another example. Regulating body temperature. Regulating body temperature. Grandma's cold all the time, right? Absolutely, right? The house could be 85 degrees inside and she needs a sweater and a blanket. What else? Digestive. Say again? Digestive. Digestive. Oh, di uh, sure, absolutely. Some ability, we, we, we get some, like for instance, lactose intolerance and things along those lines. We get less able to uh, stretch and be able to accommodate larger volumes of food. Right? <clears throat> How about bones, right? And bone growth, bone healing, yes, right? You can actually, you can hold a baby at chest height, drop that baby and it will actually bounce back into your arms. Okay, maybe not. Don't drop babies. All right, <laughs> do not drop babies. But so while nobody should drop babies, there are plenty of examples of babies that have rolled off of changing tables. And when a baby mm -hmm. rolls off a changing table, is that baby typically hurt by that? They get no. upset, they cry, but they're typically not hurt because at that point, they're mostly rubber, right? They're cartilage at that point. 
If you hold grandma at chest height and drop grandma, does she bounce back into your arms? No, no. No, if grandma rolls off a changing table, grandma shatters when she hits the ground. Right. So again, our ability to be able to repair, our ability to maintain homeostasis, all of those things are things that change as we age. All right. Questions on that? No. All right. Excellent. That is it for our introduction. Uh, we are doing good on time. Perfect. So uh, what we're going to do is this is a good stopping point for our first break. So we will go ahead and take our first break. Let's do this. Um, because we still have time. If you have not done so already, uh, please make sure you uh, do the attendance quiz. It should still be available. The access code is LOCK, L-O-C-K, all lowercase. Uh, so for those of you who had trouble, please, I encourage you to do that again. Uh, and we will take a, uh, we'll call it a 10-minute break, come back at 9.15. And we will start the recording at that point. So any questions before we take our break? All right, go run, go to the bathroom, get a coffee, check your price of turnips, whatever it is you need to do, get those things done, and I will see you back here in 10 minutes. All right. All righty, let's go ahead and get started. Real quickly, because there are a couple more questions uh, before class and then a couple after. Uh, it seems some people are still having problems uh, accessing the chemistry quiz. I'm still not 100% sure what the issues of those are, uh, but again, that's the whole point of doing these things now so we can work out these kinks now. Uh, so uh, in order to meet after class and, and talk with people and also to give up people an opportunity to work out those kinks, I've extended uh, the availability uh, for the chemistry quiz till 8 p.m. tonight. So that hopefully that should be able to give everybody the opportunity to uh, figure out what the issues are and we can get those issues resolved because like I said I want to get this resolved now here on these things because uh, this so that these things aren't happening when we're doing these exams for real because this kind of leniency won't be something we'll be able to do for real but for the simple chemistry quiz uh, and like the proctorio if you're having the problems with that one still we'll work those out uh, so there should be time after class today as well as an opportunity um, uh, after class ends uh, to uh, to continue to discuss this and work with people and be able to figure that out. All right. And like I said, hopefully everybody has done the uh, attendance quiz uh, for that as well. All right. Let's go ahead then and uh, dive back into lecture. Whoops, wrong button. That is what I want. And like I said, our goal now is to build that foundation that is going to help us to complete 430 and allow us to complete all of 431 as well. And that is to start talking about cells and chemistry and tissues and starting first with uh, chemicals. As I said, what we're mostly interested in is the organic compounds. Uh, yes, the question? Yeah, sorry. Um, quick question. All the slides, the PowerPoints that we're looking at, we have access to this in Canvas, correct? Yep. Uh, under the modules okay. in Canvas, you have all the lecture handouts. Absolutely. Okay. Got it. Yeah. And again, I, I purposely do that because I figure if you're furiously writing down what's on the screen, then you're not listening to what I'm saying. So right. again, you are responsible for everything we talk about and everything I talk about won't be on the screen, but it saves you a little bit of time of not having to write down what's already on there. So yes, uh, organic compounds, of course, carbon and all of its functional groups. And again, the key with carbon, what makes carbon so important for organic compounds is that it can form, and there's that magical word again, many covalent bonds, but we should be more specific. How many covalent bonds can carbon actually form? Four. Four, there you go, excellent. It can form four covalent bonds, and so it allows it to form very large, very complex, very stable structures. Now, this is not an organic chemistry class. I'm not going to make you know what an amino group looks like, or a phospho phosphate group looks like, or even a hydroxyl group looks like, but we will talk about phosphates, we will talk about hydroxyl groups, we will talk about you know, uh, uh, amino groups and things along those lines. So if uh, you get lost in that material, your book does have uh, functional groups uh, and uh, lists of them and what they are and how they're important. So you can look at that if you uh, get a little lost on the material. 
But like I said, our goal is to talk about these organic compounds. And basically when we talk about organic compounds, we primarily define them by size. Some of it is organization, but it's primarily by size. And when we're talking about organic compounds, we talk about them in terms of monomers, polymers, and macromolecules, right? And we can think of these in terms of something that everybody really understands, like Legos, right? A little blue square Lego is a building block. And that would be a perfect example of a monomer. If I took 14 of those little blue blocks and put them together into a big long line, that would be an example of a polymer. A polymer is basically a repetitive pattern of monomers. However, the beauty of Legos is I don't just have blue squares that I can build with, right? There are orange triangles and, you know, and green rectangles and flat pieces and all these different pieces. And so as I take all of those together and build my little Lego house uh, with all different types of building blocks, that would be an example of a macro molecule. And so that's, of course, what our goal is, is to talk about these macro molecules. A macromolecule is a large organic molecule. They're essential for the body structure and function. And there are four main classifications of macromolecules. What are they? Give me an example of one. What's the type of macromolecule? Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, excellent. Proteins. Right, oh, yep, absolutely correct. But hold on one at a time though. Carbohydrates, <laughs> uh, which is a fancy way really of saying what? What's carbohydrates a fancy way of saying? Carbs. And True, carbs, yeah. but, but what else? What else, what else are carbs? Um, sugars. Sugars, there you go, absolutely. These are sugars. I heard someone say proteins, excellent. What's proteins a fancy way of saying? No, well, proteins are just proteins. Okay, there we go. <laughs> What's uh, the next one? That's... True, fats, although we need a fancy word for fats. What's the fancy word for fats? Lipids. Lipids, Lipids excellent. And hold on, I see someone's in the chat. I gotta get my chat window back up. Excellent, perfect, we got the lipids there. And what's the fourth? Nucleic acid. Nucleic acid. There you go, excellent. Nucleic acids, perfect, excellent. Those are our four macromolecules. Remember we talked about in the last class how 60% of our body is water. That means it's 40% stuff, and this is the stuff. Carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. This is the stuff that makes up our bodies, right? And again, I've written it here on the, on the screen, but we can also look at the pretty words that say that as well. So let's talk a little bit about each of these macromolecules, starting first with our carbohydrates. Uh, again, or what we commonly refer to as our sugars. Let's put sugar under here just as a reminder. Carbohydrates serve many functions, but the primary functions are to provide energy and to provide structure. Those are the two primary functions of carbohydrates. Right? Most of you know this because most of you had some form of carbohydrate for breakfast this morning. Right? Maybe you had a potato uh, with your eggs. Maybe you had a big bowl of cereal or something along those lines. You had some type of uh, cereal, some type of carbohydrate for breakfast. Right? One of the keys with carbohydrates is that they are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, but the real key to a carbohydrate is that carbohydrates have a two to one ratio of hydrogen to oxygen. The key to this is they have lots of oxygen uh, in them, so with carbohydrates. So again, they're just comprised primarily of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen with lots of oxygen, with basically a two to one ratio of hydrogen to oxygen. Not surprisingly, there are three major groups of carbohydrates, and those are based on their size. Starting first with our monosaccharides. Monosaccharides include glucose, include fructose, galactose, ribose, deoxyribose. Monosaccharides are typically uh, comprised of 
a five or six carbon ring. So what that means is that, and again, we'll do a horrible job of drawing here. We have, let's say an example of five carbons that are bounded together into a ring. And of course, they'll have functional groups coming off of them as well. So again, there can be functional groups that are coming off of these things, but basically they're either a five carbon ring or uh, they can be a six carbon ring. This is so much easier to do when I've got a board. There you go. Yeah, but look at those straight lines. Uh, well, that's because I cheated and used the straight line drawer. <laughs> if I had to actually draw that by hand, then it would be horrible. Yeah, but so we have either a five or a six carbon ring uh, together with its functional groups coming off. And these are our monosaccharides. Like I said, these are going to be our building blocks. These are the ones that are gonna be uh, used to make the larger, more complex carbohydrates that Stephanie's talking about, absolutely. We're putting more of, more of them together. Um, oh yeah, when we're gonna to get to what a complex carbohydrate is in just a second, uh, firm or simple. Right, and then that's the other key too. Notice each of these is a covalent bond. And remember when you break bonds, you release energy. So the advantage of having these monosaccharides is these monosaccharides are going to be the fuel, the energy uh, that we are going to need to basically produce uh, and do work in our body. And of course we use that energy to make ATP. So these are our building blocks and every time we break one of these bonds, we release energy. So by having lots of bonds, uh, we are able to use these and release their energy. However, what we want to do is take these uh, monosaccharides and put two of them together. So I'm going to cheat, totally cheat, by just using a couple diamonds here to represent my five and six carbon sugar because I'm cheap, uh, easy. Uh, and basically, as I mentioned, they have functional groups coming off of them. One of those functional groups they have coming off of them are hydroxyl groups and hydroxyl groups are made of an oxygen and a hydrogen. When we want to put two of these together, what we end up doing is taking this bond and forming the bond between these two functional groups. And what ends up happening is that it is an oxygen I'm not going to be able to change that, am I? Nope. It is going to be oops, an oxygen that holds this together. What that means is that one of the hydroxyl groups is lost and the other hydroxyl group loses a hydrogen. As a result of that, when we form that bond between the two amino acids, we produce dihydrous monoxide, right? Which sounds really fancy, but is there another word for dihydrous monoxide? Water. Water, H2O, exactly. So notice when we form that bond, we are drawing water out of the molecule, which is why this bond formation is called dehydration synthesis. Conversely, if we want to break the bond then, we use a water to split them apart, and when we split them apart, both get a hydroxyl group. So we're using water, hydro, to lyse, split them apart. Now again, I've done an amazing job of drawing this here on the board, but we also have some pretty pictures from your textbook that show this as well. So notice when we're forming a bond, and this is important, we're talking about it here in carbohydrates, but this is also how we form bonds to make proteins as well. Uh, so again, this process of dehydration synthesis to make the bond and hydrolysis to break the bonds are used for both carbohydrates and for proteins. So here again, we have those hydroxyl functional groups 
we form a bond and that bond shares the oxygen and a water is pulled out from that process. Or if we want to break the bond, we have to use water to split that into the two hydroxyl groups. And so we're able to do it that way. And so using dehydration synthesis, uh, we are going to be able to take our monosaccharides and combine them to make some disaccharides. And let's talk about some important examples. Starting first with, uh, you take a glucose and a fructose and you put them together and you get sucrose. Where might you find sucrose? What makes sucrose so vitally important? What is the other name for sucrose? And I know you guys know this. Sugar. Sugar, it's simple sugar, absolutely, right? This is on the counter at every Starbucks, right? Uh, again, everybody's home baking bread now, so having that table sugar <laughs> is vitally important for that as well. Also, speaking of baking all of that bread, depending on what type of breads you're making, you may need to use a glucose and a galactose together to make a lactose. Where would you find that lactose? Milk. In milk. It is milk sugar, absolutely. However, while we're all at home, probably the most vital of all of the disaccharides, you take two glucoses and put it together, and you get the most vital of all disaccharides, maltose. And what makes maltose so vital for human existence? Use maltose for. Come on, don't pretend like you don't know. Is it alcohol? Exactly. You use it to malt barley. And when you malt barley, what do you get? Beer. Beer, there you go, exactly. Without that maltose, you don't get beer. So there you go. Excellent. All right. So again, just some examples of how we use that dehydration synthesis to put a couple uh, monosaccharides together to form disaccharides. Now, monosaccharides and disaccharides together are what we call our simple sugars. Again, they're very simple. Um, they are, are, are basic molecules, but like we said and we were talking about before, they have a large number of covalent bonds that can be broken to release a large amount of energy. So these are the things that are used for fuel. They're easily, readily available and used for fuel. However, uh, we don't necessarily need to use all our fuel right at, uh, all the time. So sometimes we need to store that and when we want to store those or we want to use them for structures, we are going to use polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are primarily made from a large number of glucose molecules. You probably haven't thought of it in these terms, but as I mentioned, you are absolutely aware of this because many of you took advantage of this this morning for breakfast. Plants are really good at storing a large amount of carbohydrates. And when we talk about that potato, when we talk about that breakfast cereal you have, uh, what is the form of the carbohydrates that it stores those molecules are that we can use them for energy? What does potato have a lot of it in it? What do you Starch. 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 There you go. Starch. Excellent. All right. Oops, spelled storage wrong. Starch, absolutely. But you know what else has a tremendous amount of carbohydrates in it? The green grass in your backyard. How many people yeah. had a big bowl of green grass for breakfast this morning? Anyone? No, that, there is a massive amount of carbohydrates inside of grass, but unless you're a cow, you probably didn't have any for breakfast. Because in that case, we are using that the, the grass uses those exact same glucoses, but they store it in a different way and it's used for structure. And what is the name of that structure? Well, let's say structure, uh, we'll just say structure. Cellulose. There you go, cellulose, excellent. It stores it in this form of cellulose, right? Again, let's talk about another vegetable eater. We have sheep and you have wolves. Sheep and wolves are about the same size animals, but the digestive system of a sheep is two and a half times longer than the digestive system of the wolf. And it's all about their diet, right? What does the wolf eat? Meat. 
it eats meat. Well, yeah, it eats the sheep. Yeah, right. It eats meat. <laughs> Absolutely. And those proteins, those amino acids break down really, really simply. Right. That sheep eats grass. And to be able to process all of that cellulose and be able to extract the nutrients out of it, it has a massively long digestive system. We mentioned the cows earlier. I think cows have something like 86 stomachs, right? Where they're constantly swallowing this food and spitting back up their cud and rechewing it again and swallowing it into a different stomach with all these complex microorganisms. They need this massively elaborate uh, system to be able to uh, break down that cellulose. And that's something that we're not able to do. Right, so that cellulose is not something we can use uh, for energy, for fuel, right? So as animals, so let's hold on. Let's, uh, I think I actually have this, so I'll go ahead and clear that now. So we have the starch, we have the cellulose for plants. So in animals, which way do we store it? Do we start as starch or do we start as cellulose? Starch. We start, store it as starch? Sort of glycogen. Ah, there you go. Trick question. You are absolutely correct. As animals, we use neither starch or cellulose. We store our carbohydrates in this molecule right here, and this molecule right here is glycogen. absolutely correct. All right, so we store it as glycogen. Glycogen is how we as animals store our carbohydrates. Now, Every single cell in our body has glycogen in it that it is storing and using for energy. But some cells are gonna have more than others. Do you have any idea of a cell that might contain a large amount of glycogen, might need a large amount of fuel? Liver. Liver, absolutely. Right. Uh, one of the things we need to do is maintain appropriate glycogen levels or glucose levels in our blood. Right. One way we could do that would be by constantly eating but most of us aren't constantly eating. So when you're not eating and the glucose starts to drip, uh, uh, drop a little bit, we can release glucose from our liver. What's another uh, cell that might have a large amount of glycogen in it? Because it needs a large amount of energy. Is it the heart? I don't know. Yeah, but we can even be more general than that. Muscle tissue, yeah. like the heart, like your muscles your skeletal muscle, your smooth muscle, all of muscle tissues are going to have a large amount of glycogen in it as well, because again, they need to produce a lot of energy. So absolutely. So all the cells in our body will have some glycogen, but some are definitely going to have more than others. All right. Questions on that? So yeah, just for confirmation, yes, the longer the carbon ring, the more energy it takes to break down, and or more specifically, not the more energy it takes to break down, the more energy that is going to be released by it. So the more uh, the more complex, the more energy potential you have in these. Because remember, when you break a bond, you're releasing energy. So the more molecules you have together, the more potential energy you have. And again, that's really what this is about. A lot of this is physics. This is chemical energy, right? Just like the gasoline in your car is chemical energy. And that chemical energy is converted by a motor And when it's converted into a motor, it's converted into motion. It's mechanical energy. This is exactly what your muscles do. Your muscles take chemical energy in the form of uh, glucose and convert it uh, with a motor into mechanical energy. Mechanical energy, all right? Again, you haven't thought of it in those terms, but you're aware of it because when we uh, drive our car. Back in ancient times, we used to go on campus for class. And so you would drive from your home to your class. When you got to the class and got a parking spot, you'd be super excited about that. So you'd give your car a nice big hug and put your face right down on the hood of your car, right? Is that what you would do whenever you get to your destination to thank your car for getting you there? <laughs> Anybody enjoy putting their face on the hood of their car? No. No, why not? It's not a trick question. Why don't you put your face on the hood of your car when you get to your destination? It's hot and dirty. It's hot. Because it's hot, absolutely. And the reason it is hot is that when it's converting that chemical energy to mechanical energy, it's not 100% efficient. Some of the energy is lost as heat. Right? 
And it's the exact same thing as you as well. Remember, as we talked about, when you get cold, what do you do? You shiver. shiver. When you're shivering, you're contracting those muscles. You're converting chemical energy into mechanical energy, and your muscles are not 100% efficient. In fact, some of your muscles lose as much as 75% of the energy in the form of heat. Think about that. If 75% of the energy of your gasoline was lost as heat instead of getting you to your destination, would that be a good car to have that only had 25% efficiency of its motor? No, that would be a horrible car to have, right? But some of our muscles are that inefficient. And that's why when we contract those muscles, we generate a massive amount of heat. Right? And that's what this is about. It's about, so it's the, these carbon rings are about breaking these bonds to release energy. All right. Carbohydrates are incredibly important, incredibly useful things, but they're not terribly exciting. So let's move to something a little bit more fun. And that little bit more fun are our lipids, or again, what we commonly refer to as fats. Of course, we will always use appropriate anatomical terms, but again, a reminder is not a bad thing. Notice like carbohydrates, fats also are comprised of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The exact same uh, atoms that are used to make carbohydrates. The big difference here though is in the ratio. Lipids have many fewer oxygen. I know that's a horrible way of describing that, but that's the way I'm gonna do it much, much less oxygen in it. So it's much higher ratio of hydrogen. This is important when it comes to their function. Because as we talked about, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, as you all know, all form covalent bonds. Remind me again what it means to form a covalent bond. Uh, sharing they, electrons. Sherry bonds. Excellent. They share electrons, absolutely. So here's molecule one, here's molecule two, and in between them, they share two electrons. But what do we know about oxygen? When it comes to sharing, does it like to share nicely? No. No. No, when oxygen shares and forms those covalent bonds, it's like a three-year-old. Three-year-olds don't like to share. They like to keep all the toys all the time right? Their favorite toy is whatever the other kid wants to play with, right? When you're three years old, oxygen doesn't like to share as much. And so it tends to keep those electrons closer to it. And of course, that gives it a partial a negative charge. Whereas whatever it's sharing with gets a partial positive. And this is a big fancy way of saying that oxygen forms polar bonds. Carbon and hydrogen though, they like to share nicely. So carbon and hydrogen primarily form nonpolar bonds. And what do we know about polar things and nonpolar things? Do they like each other? Yeah. Let me ask the question this way. When you're having your salad for dinner and you reach into the a refrigerator and grab the Italian dressing, what's the first thing you do? Shake it. Shake it, shake it up. Why do you shake it up? To it's mix separated. everything. Because it's separated. Why is it separated? Because they don't mix well together. Right. Because you have polar water and nonpolar oil and polar and nonpolar things don't like each other. Right, And so that's the key. With these lipids, by having fewer oxygen in them, they have fewer co polar covalent bonds, and they don't like water. They're hydrophobic. Right? Instead of salad, maybe you're having lasagna for dinner. And so after you're done with that dish, you put the casserole dish in the sink, and you fill it filled with water, and you see this nice, huge, big oil spill form in the center of the pan where all the oil has come together into a big, huge glob at the center because it's trying to avoid the water. Water and oil don't mix. Water and fats don't mix. And that's because most, and again, there's that pesky word again, most lipids are hydrophobic. Most lipids are nonpolar. All right. And so polar things like water 
and uh, nonpolar things like fats don't like each other. Now, there are a lot more types of lipids than there are carbohydrates, and I'm not going to just sit here and rattle off all of them because there's over a dozen. But there are some important ones I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about, and then others as we run into as we work our way through the class, we'll talk about in more depth. The most common lipid found in the body are what are known as triglycerides, or what we commonly refer to as neutral fats. A triglyceride has a fairly simple shape. Basically what it has is an alcohol, uh, I guess if I spell alcohol correctly, and off that alcohol, it has three fatty, acid tails. These fatty acid tails are comprised almost entirely of carbon and hydrogen molecules. Now again, I'm not going to make you draw this. You need to be able to recognize a molecule like this, but here is the uh, molecular structure of it. And again, you don't have to memorize this molecular structure, but you need to recognize the shape of it, where we have, again, a alcohol, in this case, glycerol, and three fatty acid tails. And as you can see, the fatty acid tails are made up almost exclusively of carbon and hydrogens. Right? Here we see it more uh, symbolically. And when we see this symbolically with the secondary structures of this, again, we see these massive rows of carbons uh, that are basically completely filled with hydrogens. And that's the other thing too. Notice with this particular triglyceride, this fatty acid, every single carbon has the maximum number of covalent bonds it can with those four bonds. And it has the maximum number of hydrogens attached to it. Because this has the, mass, the maximum number of hydrogens possible attached to it, we refer to it as a saturated fatty acid. Notice this one's also a saturated fatty acid. However, notice this one here. With this one here, there is a single double bond that forms between two of the carbons. Notice this carbon still gets its four bonds. This carbon still gets its four covalent bonds. So we've made all our bonds necessary, but this one doesn't have all of the maximal amount of hydrogens it could have because of that double bond. So this is an unsaturated fat. And we can be even more specific than that. Notice it only has one double bond. So we refer to it as a mono unsaturated fat. If on the other hand, it had two or more double bonds into it, how would we refer to it then? Disaturated? Bi unsaturated? Yeah, there you go, polyunsaturated. Oh. Fatty acid, excellent. Now, notice one more thing. When these double bonds form, it causes the fatty acids to kink. You may not have thought of the difference between saturated and unsaturated fats or mono versus poly, but you did know something about them. Give me an example of saturated fats. Give me an example of a saturated fat. Butter. Butter. Give me another one. Lard. Shortening. All of those are saturated fats. Give me an example of an unsaturated fat. Vegetable oil. Vegetable oil, olive oil, right? What's the big difference between those two things? One's liquid and one solid. Yeah, at room temperature, notice with saturated fats, because the saturated fat, uh, fatty acids are straight and linear, they line up much easier. So typically saturated fats are solid at room temperature. Whereas unsaturated, because they're all kinked in there, they don't line up quite as nice, so they tend to be liquid at room temperature. And of course, which of the two are typically better for you? Unsaturated. Unsaturated fats are typically better for you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right. Now, again, what do we use these triglycerides for? Oh, and here's some more, again, 
uh, we see an example of another fatty acid. And again, here we see an example of an unsaturated with that kink, with that double bond versus a saturated. And again, it's all carbons and hydrogens. Uh, so we see that to do that. Now, what do we typically use these triglycerides for? What are their function? Storage of energy. energy. Excellent. These are energy storage, absolutely. Remember, as we talked about, breaking bonds releases energy. Notice this single fatty acid has way more bonds to it than a glucose does. In fact, uh, fatty acids typically provide more energy, more chemical energy than a glucose does, but it's harder to break down. So it's not as easy to break down, it takes longer to break it down, but it has a tremendous amount of energy. Do we use these triglycerides for anything else? Cell membranes. These aren't the ones for the cell membranes. We are going to use a lipid for the cell membrane, but it's not going to be this one. You are right, though. We absolutely are going to use lipids for cell membranes, but not this one. This one has another function as well besides energy. Yeah. Come on. Some of us have more of it than others. Adipose tissue. Right. Well, it's stored in adipose, and what does that adipose do for us? Stores energy. Protection. It stores energy, and there you go. Protection was the magic word I was looking for. Protection, right? That's what I keep trying to tell my wife. I'm not fat, I'm just protecting my internal organs, right? Or it provides insulation, helping for temperature regulation, right? Uh, it helps to protect our kidneys, for instance, right? One of the things that, uh, you know, again, one of the, uh, uh, the things that happens now that we're all in quarantine, Right? Uh, one of the big things that's been going around is basically there's going to be three possible outcomes for everybody from this. You either become a hunk, you become a drunk, or you become a chunk. Right? And so one of the things that you may be doing is you may be on the not wanting to go shopping diet. So you're on the popcorn diet. You have one piece of popcorn for breakfast, one piece of popcorn for dinner, and a reasonable three pieces of popcorn for dessert at the end of the day. Right? Now, if you do that, are you going to end up losing weight as a result of that? Yeah, yeah. It's a pretty extreme diet, and it's not a healthy way to do that. There are people who get, for instance, stomach stapling or those stomach bands put in where they look at do this extreme weight loss. Uh, one of the things about adipose tissue and, and our triglycerides is they're very dynamic. They're constantly being transported throughout our body. But when you have massive rapid weight loss, what happens is it's not able to redistribute itself. And we're all focused on losing that subcutaneous fat, but the problem is we lose internal fat as well. Your kidney is held together in a pouch of fat called the, the fat capsule, the adipose capsule. And what happens with massive weight loss, one of the things that can happen is that your kidney can actually lose that pocket and actually descend in the abdominal pelvic cavity. It's a condition we call a ptosis. When that ptosis occurs, the fact that the kidney is a little lower isn't necessarily in and of itself a big deal. But remember that kidney by the ureter is connected to the bladder. And if the kidney goes down, what happens is your ureter can kink. And if you put a kink in a hose, what happens? Stops working. Stops it won't flow. Absolutely. It so what happens up. is you've got your kidney, you've got your ureter that comes out of it. And if that ureter ends up kinking, then what happens is the urine backs up into the kidney you get an increase in pressure in the kidney, and the kidney can be severely damaged by that. So when people go on these, uh, you know, like these um, uh, Biggest Loser TV shows, or when they do the lap banding or things like those types of things, again, with a doctor observing them, one of the things the doctor's constantly looking at is their urine output to make sure that they're not having this ptosis of their kidney that takes place. So yeah. The lipids, these triglycerides provide energy, provide a protection, provide that insulation for us. Like I said, super useful, but not as fun. And as someone else mentioned, we have a much more fun a lipid that helps us to form our plasma membrane. That special lipid that helps us to form the plasma membrane is a phospholipid. A phospholipid also has a head region like the triglyceride and fatty acid tails like the triglyceride, but the difference is that with a phospholipid, it only has two fatty acid tails. It's the easiest way to tell it apart from a triglyceride is that it's only gonna have two fatty acid tails. 
but there's something else really important about it. As we expect, these fatty acid tails are nonpolar, or again, we could say they're hydrophobic. Oops. But what makes our phospholipid so special is that its head is actually polar. It's actually hydrophilic. It likes water. This is incredibly useful because as someone mentioned, when we make our cell, our plasma membrane of our cell is gonna be comprised of phospholipids. Because if you think about it, there is a whole lot of water out here outside of our cell. So what we need to do is we need to have these phospholipids set up so that the head region is pointing here to the water so our plasma membrane can interact with the water and the stuff that's in the water outside of our cell. But then we have the fatty acid tails that are gonna provide that protection to keep the things and limit what can get into and out of the cell. Anybody have a problem with that? I do. Where's most of the water in the body? Inside the body. I mean, in the membrane. Inside the cells, absolutely. There's a whole lot of water inside the cell. Excellent. Oh, so I got it backwards. That's right. What happens is the phospholipids have their heads inward and then their tails pointing outward so that they can interact with the water inside. Well, that doesn't work either. So what do we do? Do we alternate them? Have one pointing out, one pointing in? Is that what we're gonna do? How do we resolve this issue? How do we use these phospholipids to deal with water both inside and outside of the cell? Bilayer. There you go, can, that's the magic connect. word. We use a bilayer, absolutely. What happens is we have not one, but two layers of phospholipids where the tails point inward towards each other, hydrophobic away from the water, and the polar heads are going to point inward towards the water in the cell and outward towards the water in the body. So the way we put these together to make a functional plasma membrane, a functional basically wall for our cell is by forming a phospholipid. And again, I've done an amazing job drawing this, but let's take a look at the pretty pictures from your textbook. Here is what our phospholipid looks like. And again, you're not gonna have to draw the chemical composition of a phospholipid, but you should be able to recognize it as having a large polar head and two fatty acid tails. So we can see that to it there. And then here, we see how they are going to be arranged to form that plasma membrane. So when we draw a cell as just a simple circle, that line that is the simple circle is so much more complex than that. And that's what we have here. We have basically two layers of phospholipids and these phospholipids uh, basically have the heads pointing out so the polar region can interact in water outside of the cell. The polar heads can interact with water and the stuff in the water inside the cell. But at the core, we have these fatty acid tails that are gonna form a protective barrier to limit what can get in and what can get out of the cell. All right. We will talk much more about phospholipids and the plasma membrane when we get to the cell, but any questions on this for now? All right, perfect. Then let's talk about some of the other lipids. Uh, one example of another lipid that we'll talk about that's very important is cholesterol. Cholesterol, as we can see here, and I'll change to my highlighter, is made up of a four carbon ring and the functional groups that come off of it. Cholesterol, I know everybody thinks of cholesterol as a bad thing, but as we'll learn, cholesterol is a very important molecule, plays an important role in forming the stability of our plasma membrane. Uh, it helps, it has plenty of other important functions as well. Two of the important functions of cholesterol, one is to produce bile salts, Bile salts are an important molecule in our digestive system that helps us to digest fats. 
But the other thing cholesterols are used for is to make hormones, in particular steroid hormones. Notice here, two are, here are two steroid hormones. We can see that they are made from cholesterol in that they both have the same four carbon rings to them. And really very minor differences in their functional groups. Their functional groups are almost identical. That must mean that these two molecules are almost identical in their function as well, right? No. No, not necessarily. In fact, the one on the right is estrogen, is an estrogen, estradiol, and the one on the left is an androgen, testosterone. Are those the kind of things you want to necessarily mix up in your body? No. No, absolutely not. Estrogens are what turn girl people into women people, and androgens like testosterone are what turn boy people into men people. So as you can see, while they're very similar molecularly, they're very, very different in their functions. Like I said, there are lots of different uh, lipids, and as I also mentioned, lipids are very dynamic as well. They need to be able to move around inside the body. And as we talked about, what is the means of transportation in the body? How do things get transported in the body? Through the blood. Right, in the blood, absolutely. And blood is primarily made up of what? Water. Blood. The water, blood. right, the blood plasma, which is water, absolutely. And as we know, lipids don't like water. So that's a problem. We don't want to take a bunch of lipids and just pour them into the blood supply and hope for the best. So what we will often do is form structures like you see here, a lipoprotein. A lipoprotein has a large number of fatty acids and other uh, 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 lipids that are water insoluble. And what we do is we coat the outer surface of them with water soluble proteins. By putting water soluble proteins on the outside, that candy coated shell allows it to become polar and allows it to be uh, uh, dissolved in water and allows it to be able to be transported throughout the body. So most lipids when they're transported in the body have to have some type of protein either around them or embedded within them that allows them to be transported throughout the body. All right, questions on that? Like I said, your book's got a nice long list of all the lipids. We've talked about some of the major ones. We'll talk about more as we get to them as we work our way through. Uh, it's a little early, but proteins gets a little bit more dense. So I think what we'll do is go ahead and take one more quick break here. Uh, again, we'll call it a 10 minute break, but let's, like I said, just make it much shorter. Come back at 10.10 and at 10, this will just be a quick chance to, to stretch, catch your breath and then re restart at, actually, let's go ahead and take a full 10 minutes. We'll do it at 10, 12. Um, Cause like I said, uh, proteins are where it's gonna get a little bit more dense uh, uh, when we get to the information that we need to know. So I think coming at this fresh will be a little bit better. All right, so any questions before we take a quick break? No. Nope. All right, meet you guys back here in 10 minutes. Let's go ahead and get started. We are halfway through our macromolecules and we are on to one of the most interesting ones, definitely a one of the most, oh, I, every time I start over, I lose my annotation tool, there we go. Uh, definitely one of the most important ones and that is proteins. One of the things that I, uh, I mentioned, I, I teach the 100 and 102 version of this class, the introductory class, and when we talk about the cell, we use the analogy that the cell is like a factory. And again, if a cell was like a factory and the job of that factory was to make shoes, well, the cell's factory, its job would be to make proteins. Uh, proteins are somewhat similar to carbohydrates and lipids in that they are comprised of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. However, one of the big differences between proteins and between uh, lipids and carbohydrates is the presence of nitrogen. So we have nitrogen here that we don't see in lipids and we don't see in uh, carbohydrates. Also, at first thought, the fact that proteins make up you know, 20% of our body weight doesn't sound like an impressive number until you remember how in last class we talked about 60% of your body weight is water. That means you're only 40% stuff, and half of that stuff is proteins. 
proteins are the most diverse of all of our macromolecules. They have the most diverse structure. And so not surprisingly, they also have the most diverse function to them as well. So these things and everything about you, uh, whether you have blue eyes or brown eyes, whether you are tall or short, whether you have a predisposition for heart disease, whether you're left-handed, your blood type, all of those things are determined by proteins. So proteins are vitally important to the function of our cells and therefore the function of our tissues, organs, and organ systems. And again, they're the most diverse in their structure, so they are the most diverse in their function. And as we keep talking about, their structure influences their function. We see that with collagen. Collagen is the most common protein found in the body. If you were to reach into the body and randomly pull out a protein, it would most likely be collagen. Collagen is a protein, if we look at its shape, and again, my artistic skills are horrible, but basically it is made of three strands of interwoven uh, protein fibers, like a thread or like a rope. And it's that rope-like structure to it that gives it its um, strength and gives it its structure. Right, again, if we were to actually in the classroom, I could divide you guys in half, put half of you on one side and half of you on the other, and you all look like fit and strong individuals, and I could toss a rope into the middle of the room, and we could spend the rest of the class time playing tug of war, with half of you pulling on one side of the rope and half of you pulling on the other. And as big and strong and fit as all of you look, are you guys gonna be able to tear that rope in half? No. No, of course not, right? Because it has what we call tensile strength. It resists that shearing and tearing forces. But that strength doesn't come from being rigid. When you guys are done playing tug of war, I can take that rope, roll it into a ball, and toss it into the trunk of my car. And that's what collagen does. It provides structure without rigidity. And again, you may not have thought of these things in these terms, but maybe like the fashion was a few years ago, everybody wanted to look like Angelina Jolie. Right? And so what was one of the things that people were having done all the time? Having collagen injected into their lips. Why would they do that? Because it gave, made them a fuller, larger, more structured lip without making it hard and rigid. Right? Or nowadays, instead of wanting to look like Angelina Jolie, right, everybody wants to look like, I don't know, JLo or somebody else. Right? So where do we get the collagen injections now? Right? Collagen injections into the butt so you can have that padunka dunk. Right? We have this collagen and it's used for these types of structures. It provides that strength, that tensile strength, that structure without rigidity. Another very different protein is called hemoglobin. What do we use hemoglobin for? It says transportation. What does hemoglobin transport? Oxygen. Oxygen. It's able to do this because it has a very different shape. Rather than being linear like collagen, uh, hemoglobin is basically a globular protein. In fact, it's a globular protein made up of four globules, four subunits that are put together. And at the center of each of these subunits is a group called a heme group. This heme group has an iron at the center of it, and it is that iron that is able to bind to oxygen. All right? Oxygen is able to bind to that iron, just like oxygen binds to that iron on the grill of your Studebaker you have in your front yard. And when that iron and oxygen comes together, what does it form? Rust. Rust, absolutely. And what color is new rust? All right, new rust sounds silly. What color is rust when it first forms? Orange. Yeah, orange is reddish color, exactly. It is the oxygen binding to that iron that gives your red blood in your red blood cells their red coloration. A single red blood cell has somewhere on the order of 250 million hemoglobin inside of it. And if each one of them can carry how, uh, four oxygen, how many oxygen can a single red blood cell carry? Eight a lot. A lot. A lot, absolutely. All right? <laughs> However, one of the most important types of proteins are our enzymes. 
Again, as I mentioned in an anatomy and physiology class, we are always careful about using words like always or using words like never. However, what I will say right now is every single chemical reaction, oops, so I spell it right, that takes place in the body has an enzyme that helps it. It doesn't mean every single chemical reaction that takes place in the body uses an enzyme, but there is an enzyme that can make every single chemical reaction in the body faster and easier. Again, I'm sure at some point someone will find some chemical reaction in the body that takes place that there is no enzyme for, but it hasn't happened yet. Enzymes are vitally important for the function of our body. Some of them are simple. An enzyme like lactase. What does lactase do for us? Come on, I know you guys know. What does lactase do? Break down lactose. Breaks yeah, down. breaks down lactose. Remember lactose, remember we saw was a disaccharide. So lactase basically uh, does hydrolysis on uh, lactose, breaking it back up into a glucose and a galactose, right? It breaks it back up uh, into its core single components. If you don't produce lactase enzyme or you produce a non-functional form of it, what do we call your condition? Lactose intolerant. Lactose intolerant, excellent, right? And so now you have to have, you know, soy milk or you can't have a three scoop ice cream sundae anymore. We all tend to decrease the amount of lactase we produce as we age. So we all become a little lactose intolerant as we get older. So it gets harder and harder to eat those four scoop ice cream sundaes as an adult as it was when you were a little kid. But, and again, eating ice cream may not seem like a vital function, but there are plenty of vital functions that are completed by enzymes. We do need to talk a little bit more about enzymes, so let's do that. But before we do that, uh, as I kind of emphasize with these three here, the function of a protein is determined by its structure. And so we have to understand the structural organizations of proteins, right? First, we have to talk about how you make a protein. The way you make a protein, as we can see here, is by taking amino acids and putting them together. Our proteins, they're building blocks, or again, what we can think of as the monomers, are amino acids. There are 20 of them, all identified by their functional groups, which are represented by R here. Uh, if you feel like you need to memorize them, feel free to do that. This is not a molecular biology class, so I'm not making you do that. Uh, uh, so you don't need to memorize the 20 amino acids, but we do need to know how they go together. Remember, as we saw here, we're gonna use those same processes of dehydration synthesis to put them together. where we're drawing water out to form that bond between them. And that bond we form uh, between amino acids is known as a peptide bond. And to break a peptide bond, we use water to break that peptide bond, which again, remember, is that process of hydrolysis to separate those amino acids from each other. So again, those same uh, chemical reactions that we talked about for carbohydrates are used here for our amino acids as well when we're putting amino acids together to form our proteins. Again, so it's a peptide bond, uh, two amino acids put together by forming that covalent bond. As we put those pep form those peptide bonds, we form what we call a polypeptide, right? These are the monomers, these are the polymers. A polypeptide is typically a sequence of amino acids between 10 and a couple thousand. And then those polypeptides are then going to be put together to form proteins. All right. And so, like I said, to understand how this works and why this is important, we have to talk about the uh, levels of structural organization of a protein. 
at its simplest level, what we call the primary level. or a primary structure, let's be specific. Oh, we'll say a level, I like level, since it says structure there. The primary level of our structural organization, as you can see here, is simply the sequence of amino acids. Right? Uh, amino acids are like alphabet. You have an alphabet made up of letters, A through Z. And you put them together, like you put D-O-G together. Oops, there we go. You put D-O-G together and you get a word. It's the same thing with the amino acids. You put them together in a sequence and that sequence is important. And does it matter exactly what this one here is? If we change, if we have a sequence of a thousand amino acids together, does it really matter if we just change one? Yes. Absolutely, and does. In fact, uh, one of the most classic examples of that is sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a condition where, remember, we talked about that globular protein that is hemoglobin. Well, what happens is that uh, with changing just one letter, changing that G to a T, let's go back here. We change one amino acid, and it changes the structure of that hemoglobin. So what happens is when that hemoglobin gets to a low pressure environment, like in a capillary, it unfolds and straightens out. And as it unfolds and straightens out, it changes the shape of the red blood cell, making it sickle shape, making it elongated. It can actually cause that blood vessel to rupture, burst, releasing all of that hemoglobin into the capillary, congesting the capillary, stopping blood flow, causing all sorts of pain and discomfort, visual impairment, all sorts of problems that occur with sickle cell anemia just from simply changing one amino acid in that sequence. So absolutely, the order of these amino acids make a huge difference. And so that primary structure, that sequence of amino acids is vitally important uh, for understanding how it's going to go together, how it's going to fold. The reason for that, as I mentioned, you don't need to know the structural groups, but let's cheat a little bit and draw a couple of them here. Let's say that's an amino acid, and that's an amino acid, and that's an amino acid. All of these have functional groups that come off of them. Some of those functional groups will have no charge. Some of them will be positively charged. And some of these functional groups can be negatively charged. Now, as we know, because anybody who's played with mag magnets know, positive and negative things, do they like each other or not like each other? Like each other. They like each other. And so what's going to happen is these two things will attract each other and they'll move towards each other. And as that does, that causes this sequence of amino acids to bend. Conversely, two negative things, are they going to like each other? No. 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 So they're going to push away from each other, and that can cause these to bend away from each other. What happens is these small little reactions, or what we refer to as hydrogen bonds, are going to form between individual sections of these amino acids. And when that occurs, it forms what we call our secondary structures. Secondary structures are basically defined as local, oops, local changes in the shape of the sequence from hydrogen bonds. And actually that's secondary level. Notice here we see a couple classic examples of this. These classic examples include a alpha helix or beta sheets that can form. The example I always like to use is, for instance, and again, this is where I normally draw on the board while I'm doing this, so I'll sneak it in down here. I think I have some room to sneak it in here on the bottom. So, uh, for instance, we could have an alpha helix that is forming on one part of it, 
and then a second part would have a beta sheet and then a third part would have alpha helixes again. So notice each one of these three components are individual secondary structures. Now notice when you put all three of them together, the individual secondary structures come together to form what we call the tertiary. And the tertiary structures or the three dimensional structures are the complete uh, 3D shape of the sequence formed. And let's change the word sequence. Go back to the term polypeptide formed by the secondary structures. So notice as we have here, we have our tertiary structure where some of them are alpha helixes, some of them are beta sheets. When you put all of those together, you have a single sequence of amino acids. You have that polypeptide chain that is formed and it forms a three-dimensional structure. However, remember when we talked about collagen, collagen was made up of three strands of amino acids. Hemoglobin was made up of four strands uh, that are bound together globular. Most proteins, and this is really the key, most proteins are made of two or more strands of polypeptides oops, put together. And so when we take those strands and put them together, like here I've got these strands, but then let's say that I also make a linear polypeptide sequence, and then maybe a globular polypeptide sequence. And when I put those all together, I have a fully functional protein. And so when I put the subunits together, that forms what we call the quaternary structure. Our quaternary structure is when we put two or more polypeptides together to form a functional protein. And this is what we want. What we have here, right down here, is now a functional protein. Get away from my functional protein. All right. I appreciate this information is a little dense, but I'll explain to you why we need to go through this. The reason we need to understand this and go through this is because when we talk about functional proteins, what we're really talking about is a bunch of polypeptides that have been put together. Each one of those polypeptides that have been put together have a specific shape to them. And the shapes of these polypeptides are formed by these secondary structures. And remind me again, what forms these secondary structures? Hydrogen forms bonds. the secondary structures? Hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds, absolutely. Hydrogen bonds form them. And luckily, as we know from taking chemistry, hydrogen bonds are super, super strong. The strongest of all the bonds, right? No. No. The what are hydrogen bonds? The weakest. The weakest. They are the weakest of all of the bonds, absolutely. These are the weakest of all bonds. In particular, hydrogen bonds are sensitive. Hydrogen bonds are sensitive to two main factors. What are the two main factors that in particular hydrogen bonds are sensitive to? I know you know it. You haven't thought of it in this way, but I know you know it. What are proteins really sensitive to? Temperature. Temperature changes. And? and chemical changes. And what? Chemical. Close. Like pH. 
pH, yes. there you go, pH changes, excellent. Temperature changes and pH changes, absolutely. Our proteins are highly sensitive. So what are two things that we have to maintain really important homeostasis of? pH of our blood, right? And the temperature of our body. Because as those things change, it affects our proteins. When you're sick, you get a fever. And that fever is a good thing because that fever makes it harder for the viruses to do their job. So you, you're cold, you're sick, you're in bed, you have a 101 degree fever and you're feeling miserable, but that fever is helping you. Well, that means if you had 110 degree temperature, that would be helping you even more, right? No. No, because if the temperature got that high, what would happen is it would break these bonds, change these hydrogen bonds, and cause the protein to change its shape. And what do we call that process? When temperature changes the shape of a protein, Denature. Denatures it, absolutely. It denatures that protein, right? Temperature and pH change it. Let's talk about another great example. In your mouth, your tongue produces an enzyme called a lingual, because it's on your tongue, lipase. What do you think a lipase breaks down? The food you eat? Yeah, but what specific food does a lipase break down? The food. Fats? Lipids. It breaks down fats. It breaks down lipids. Absolutely. Does that mean if I put a chunk of fat in my mouth, my enzyme will break it down if I leave it in my mouth? No. Because no. it turns no. out no. That, that enzyme is produced in a non-functional form. It isn't till it reaches your stomach. When it reaches your stomach, it changes shape and becomes functional. Why does it change shape in your stomach? Why is it functional in your stomach and change shape, but it's not functional in your mouth? What's the difference between your mouth and your stomach? The acid. acid pH. pH. Acid. There you go. What's the pH in your mouth? Mm. Alkaline, maybe? No, it's about seven. Oh. What's the pH in your stomach? Acidic. It's very acidic, like one to two. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely. You guys have got it. Absolutely. Things like temperature, things like pH change the shape of the protein. And if we change the shape of the protein, we change the function of that protein. So it's vitally important, right? I got to erase this so that I can bring this up. Again, that change in pH, that change in temperature causes a denaturation. It causes that protein to denature, to distort and change its shape. And if it changes its shape, it changes its function. All right? So again, that's why we need to understand this structural organization. Not only does the order of which amino acid you use form, but which amino acid determines what secondary structures form. Those determine the tertiary structure. And when you take those subunits and put them together, you get a fully functional protein that has a precise shape. And that precise shape is important in lots of places, but in particular, one of the places where it is important is dealing with enzymes. Uh, enzymes, again, are biological catalysts. You can typically recognize an enzyme because it is going to end with the suffix ace. Now, I say it is a biological catalyst, but explain to me what a catalyst is. It's a uh, like medium between two elements. Okay, excellent. Allows a reaction to happen quicker. Excellent. I like that. It allows, so it allows uh, a reaction to occur more quickly. How? Decreasing the threshold. Right. Well, exactly. Like, so right, down, um, right. It lowers the activation energy. Makes it easier for the chemical reaction to take place. So if I have a fire and I add oxygen to it, that fire burns brighter. Does that mean that oxygen is a catalyst? Mm -hmm. Cody, didn't you know this? Yeah, but that's not, that's not my understanding of how that works. Well, because you're absolutely right. Oxygen isn't a catalyst. Why isn't oxygen a catalyst? Because the fire is already going wouldn't True. be not starting it up the activation energy is already there true but we can make but any and the same thing is true for chemical reactions in our body chemical reactions in our body will occur without enzymes 
But with the enzymes, we can make them occur faster. We can make them occur easier and more readily. So like right. using gasoline instead of uh, trying to light with a flint and try a brush. And, and those are both good, but again, neither of those are catalysts because there's one other key definition to a catalyst that uh, we have to add to this definition. Oxygen and gasoline, both of those things will make a fire and make a fire faster, but what happens to them in the fire? They disappear. They get consumed, exactly. And that's the key to a catalyst. A catalyst is not used up. by the chemical reaction. A, ca a catalyst is not used up in the chemical reaction. In fact, a catalyst is unchanged by the chemical reaction. And the advantage of that is it can be used again and again, right? Oxygen and gasoline are accelerants. They make a fire grow bigger, but they're not catalysts because they are consumed. A catalyst is lowers the activation energy, makes a chemical reaction happen faster, but it's not used up by the chemical reaction. It's not changed by the chemical reaction. And that's the real key. It can be used again and again and again. In fact, some enzymes are able to facilitate as much as 2,000 chemical reactions in a second. They can be massively, massively active. Now, the other cool thing about enzymes, as we talked about, is they are highly specific. They are highly specific because uh, they are going to be, have a specific, what we call an uh, active site, or what we could also refer to as a binding site. Both of those would be acceptable terms for that, that are gonna be unique to whatever molecule they're specifics for. So like we said, lactase just has a binding site for lactose, where it is gonna facilitate that chemical reaction. Again, they're highly efficient, but only under optimal conditions. Remember, as we talked about, temperature and pH can change how efficient uh, these things are going to be. All right. Your book's got a really nice picture that I really like that does a good job of kind of illustrating this process. Notice we have a big globular, hold on, let's clear all of that. Grab my spotlight. We have a big globular protein here that has a couple holes. That is the active site or the binding site, where in this case, two amino acids are gonna bind. When they bind here, the enzyme facilitates the chemical reaction, forms that peptide bond between them with dehydration synthesis. Our now polypeptide goes away and our enzyme is unchanged by the process. And your textbook does a decent job of showing this here. The only thing I don't like about this illustration is it kind of shows the enzyme is kind of lazy in this process. Enzymes can actually be very dynamic. Let me show you another example. This one's not from your textbook, but I do wanna show you uh, this beautiful example of an enzyme. Here we have an enzyme, a big globular protein enzyme. And notice here in pink, that is the binding site. That is the active site. Notice in this case, two molecules, molecule A, molecule B, come in and bind with the enzyme. When they bind with an enzyme, and here's that fancy word again, it undergoes a conformational change. Again, call grandma up and say, hey grandma, guess what? When molecules bind to an enzyme, that enzyme undergoes a conformational change. She'll be very impressed and she'll send you $20 in the mail. But remember, undergoes a conformational change is just a fancy way of saying that the molecule changes shape. Notice when it changes shape, it brings the two molecules together, facilitating the binding of those molecules, and a new molecule is formed. Notice once that chemical reaction takes place, though, our enzyme unwinds, and it is now back to exactly what it was before. It is dynamic in the process, but it is unchanged in the process. And so this enzyme can be used hundreds, if not thousands of times. All right, questions on that? Excellent, we will talk um, about a lot about proteins and a lot about enzymes. I'm sorry, was there a question? Yeah, I might have a question. Yeah. Um, so, 
is that why uh, body temp is kind of kept a bit high, I guess, to make enzymes more efficient? Well, it depends on the enzyme. You were, you, so yes and no. We keep a very stable blood uh, temperature, body temperature, because our enzymes are only efficient within a narrow range of values. A nice window or something. Yeah. yeah. Now, like I said, when we're sick, we reset our uh, temperature at a higher level. And the reason we do that is to, uh, to, in hit to hinder or retard uh, the viral replication. Viruses use enzymes as well. And if we can make it harder for them to replicate, it's gonna be easier for our body to defend ourselves. However, we have to be careful. If our body temperature gets too high, so then we start proteins. hurting our enzymes as well. So then we're not just hurting the virus's enzymes, but we're hurting our enzymes as well. And like I said, since every chemical reaction that has ever been found in the human body has an enzyme that helps it, if we start hurting our enzymes, we're in severe trouble ourselves. Great question. Any others? All right, excellent. So like I said, we'll spend a lot of time talking about proteins and protein synthesis and all the fun things that go along that when we get to the cell, but we have one more important macromolecule to talk about, and that is our nucleic acids. Like all this nucleic acid is our macromolecule. And like all macromolecules, it is comprised of monomers. The monomer of a nucleic, of a nucleic acid is what is known as a nucleotide. And that's what we see over here on the side. A nucleotide basically has three main components. To them. Uh, the first one, as we see here, is a phosphate group. Again, it is a functional group. I'm not going to make you be able to draw a phosphate group, but one of the things you do need to know about phosphate groups is that they are very negative. They're very negatively charged. Phosphate groups are very, very negatively charged. We definitely, definitely need to know that. All right. So you don't have to draw a phosphate group, but you need to know it's negatively charged. The second component is a five carbon sugar. And there are two types that can be found here. And I know you haven't thought of it in those terms, but I know you know it. What are the two possible five carbon sugars that can be found here? Deoxyribose. Excellent. One of them is deoxyribose. And then, of course, the other one is? What's the other one then? How about ribose? There you go, ribose. There you go, deoxyribose and ribose. There are two types. Yeah, someone get in the chat? Sorry, I closed the chat window again. Perfect, excellent. Yep, absolutely correct. Ribose is the second one. So one of two sugars is going to be here, either deoxyribose or ribose. And the third component is a nitrogen base. So we have these nitrogenous bases here. And just out of curiosity, how many total possible nitrogenous bases can there be? Five. five. There you go, five, absolutely. And for right now, let's just worry about letters. What are the letters associated with those five? A, C, G, T, and U. Perfect. Adenine, cytosine, Cytosine, guanine, thymine, and uracil. Five possible bases. You take one of these bases, you take one of these two sugars, you slap a phosphate on it, and you get what we call a nucleotide. You get one of the building blocks necessary for producing nucleic acids. Of course, what are nucleic acids important for? Replication. 
All right, they contain our, they, exactly, they're important for replication. We need them for replication. Uh, we'll talk about purines and pyrimidines uh, later. Uh, there are two different flavors of nitrogen bases. We'll talk about those later. But the function of nucleic acids are to contain all of our genetic information. Our deoxyribonucleic acid, if this is a deoxyribose and four of these potential uh, nitrogen bases, you put them together and we make our DNA. Yes, Ron. Um, is it uyrosyl RNA? Yep, exactly. Yeah, so uh, we will remember. talk much more about this when we get to mitosis and we get to replication, but you are absolutely correct. And it replaces um, thymine? Yep. So adenine, cytosine, and guanine, those three are used for both DNA and RNA. Thymine is DNA only, and uracil is RNA only. So both DNA and RNA only have four nitrogen bases they use. Three of them they share, and two of them, one only DNA uses and one only RNA uses. So not only are DNA and RNA different in which sugar they use, obviously DNA uses deoxyribose, and ribose, uh, RNA uses ribo, uh, ribose for their sugar, but they're gonna be slightly different in which a nitrogen base they use as well. So you are correct. They are different structurally that way. DNA, is our deoxyribonucleic acid. And again, remember spelling counts in this class, so do not abbreviate. Deoxyribonucleic acid, if I uh, showed you a molecule of DNA on the exam, make sure you write out deoxyribonucleic acid. Now I will say for essay questions, you just have to write something out once and then you can abbreviate it after that. But deoxyribonucleic acid, which after you've written out once, you can abbreviate DNA, is coded for our genes. Our genes are basically specific sequences of DNA that code for polypeptides. They're what make our proteins. And like I said, those proteins determine everything about us. This DNA then is pretty darn important. So it is locked up inside of our nucleus so that it can be protected. But if we need to use the information to make proteins, then what needs to happen is we need a temporary and mobile copy of this. And that temporary and mobile copy of the information is our ribonucleic acid, our RNA. And it carries the message of the DNA to the cell so that we can make it. This is the beginning of the process of protein synthesis. We're going to be talking about cells. We're going to be talking about protein synthesis. Uh, I say next week, but I really mean Tuesday and Thursday. I mean Thursday and Friday. So like I said, I encourage you to start looking at these things, looking at mitosis, looking at the cell over the next uh, day and a half so that we are rendering to go on Thursday. All right. So this is that protein. Uh, this is the beginning of our process of protein synthesis. We'll talk about uh, Nucle nucleotides in more depth. We'll talk about these nitrogen bases. I'll define what a purine is, a pyrimidine is, and all of those things as we move a little further into the cell. But this is a good starting point for this. All right? Questions on this? This is everything we need to know about nucleic acids except for one hugely important thing. And that one hugely important thing we need to talk about involves a very specific nucleotide. That very specific nucleotide starts with a ribose sugar. So here we are going to put a ribose. And here for our nitrogen base, we are going to put an adenine. All right, those things that we're going to put together, but we're going to do a little bit more than that as well. And let's take a look here. Notice what we've done. We are going to take an adenine, nitrogen base, a ribose sugar, and our phosphate. This is our nucleotide. 
However, notice to this nucleotide, we're adding a second phosphate. Now remember, the thing, one thing I told you about phosphates is that phosphates are really, really negative. So this phosphate here is really negative, and this phosphate here is really negative. And as we talked about, do negative things like other negative things? No. No, they don't. And so is it going to be easy to put these two things together? No. No, they're not going to want to go together. So notice what we have to do to get these things to put, go together is we have to use a lot of energy. Basically what happens is we form what we call a high energy bond where it takes a lot of energy to put these two things together but we're kooky enough to not even stop there we've put two of these things together making it really really negative and now just because we're just that kooky we decide to add a third now we're trying to add a third negative thing to two really, really negative things, and it's really, really not going to like that, which means we are going to have to produce, and I think the technical term for it is a really, really high energy bond is it to just add Sorry. this regular thing, this third thing to the two that were there before. Is it just too uh, unstable if you add another one? Like, well, well it, to, add, to add a fourth would be even harder. We would require yeah. even more energy. Just and much. so it isn't something that's necessarily done biologically. Would it be possible? Yes, but you'd have to use even more energy. So notice what we have here are two very high energy bonds putting these three phosphates on my adenine and ribose. And of course, because it's on the screen right now, what is the fancy word for this molecule? Adenosine triphosphate. Adenosine triphosphate, which after you've written out once, we can abbreviate as ATP. ATP is basically the energy of the cell. ATP is what the cell uses to do work. And this is how it's able to do it. Basically, what a cell does is, and here's the fancy word for it, it phosphorylates. Phosphor, where, hold on, where am I typing? I'm not typing anywhere. Uh, it phosph, oh, that's not right. It phosphorylates our ATP. And when that happens, uh, here, I'll write it up here. With that ATP, basically what happens is we split it, we phosphorylate it, and when that occurs, what happens is we get a DP, adenosine diphosphate, plus a phosphate, and we release all that energy. And that energy is what the cell does, uses to do work. So basically we break off, we rip off this phosphate, op releasing all of this energy, all this massive energy we use to put this on there, we release that energy and the cell uses that energy to do work. And what we're left with is adenosine diphosphate. But remember, while this bond isn't quite as high as this one, this bond can be broken as well. So what would happen is we would get our, we would split our ADP and from that we would get a phosphate, we would get energy, and what molecule would we be left with? Again, these are on the screen, it should be pretty easy. Adenosine monophosphate, All right, here. Oops, I thought I did that. Okay, I guess not. All right, I'll cheat. So, there. That molecule right there, oops, hold on, 
is adenosine monophosphate, right? When we add one phosphate to it, we have adenosine diphosphate. When we add a third to it, we have adenosine triphosphate. This is the energy molecule of the cell. When it comes time for the cell to need to do some work, what the cell does is it breaks this bond. When it breaks this bond, it releases that phosphate. That's why it's called phosphorylation. We remove the phosphate. And when we break that, it releases all of that energy. And that energy is used to do work. It can pump ions out of the cell. It can change the shape of the cell. It can cause your muscles to contract and move. We can release that energy. We can also release energy by also breaking the second bond as well. We could break ADP into AMP, releasing a phosphate, but the second bond doesn't have as much as the first. So again, I think most people have heard of ATP before, but I think most people don't actually know what ATP actually is. ATP is actually a special nucleotide, an adenine nitrogen base on a ribose with three phosphates. And that is our energy molecule. So while most people have heard of ATP before, most people have never actually seen it and don't actually know what it is, that it's actually a nitrogen base. And now we know what ATP is. All right, questions on that? All right, with that, we are done with chemistry. That is everything we have to talk about for that. I want to take, uh, it's uh, again, a little bit earlier than I know I like to, but we're doing really good time-wise. So we're going to take one more break, then we're going to come back. Uh, we're going to talk about the microscope and histology. We are going to talk about uh, cells a little bit and get to get us started and ready for the next class. All right. Any questions on that? All right. Let's take a quick 10-minute break. So again, come back at, uh, we'll call it 11. 11, because that's a nice round number. And I will start the recording. And uh, we will finish up with the last little bit of today. I think we're going to finish a little bit early today, but that is okay. Because like I said, there are some technical issues I want to talk to people about. And I have a question. Ryan, are you asked, did you have your hand up or did, was that from before? Uh, that was from before. Do I okay. click it again to put it down? I took care of it for you. But yeah, sorry. Okay. I, just, I, right. I have a quick question. Yes, yes. Um, so for when, when we come back, back at 11, 11, are we going to be looking at the histology handout? Is that something that we can use to follow along, or is um, there another resource? Great question. Uh, so what I would say is the histology handout is really just something I've provided for you. Um, oh, okay. There isn't an assignment on it, but like I said, uh, the idea of taking a three-dimensional structure and cutting it in slices and looking at a two-dimensional view of it is something that people are challenged by sometimes. And so if, if you haven't had a lot of microscope experience, uh, that histology review, which is not something I wrote, it's something I totally stole uh, from uh, when I was teaching one of the other schools, but I think it is a great review that can really help people uh, to understand what it means to look at a microscope and to look at slides. So I want to talk about microscopes and slides and histology and then briefly start talking about cells and what we're going to be doing on Monday. So it, it, we're not, we don't have a ton to cover uh, left, but uh, rather than pushing on, I think it's okay to take a quick break and then we'll come back and do that. So yes, I think okay. if you haven't had a lot of microscope experience, that histology ha handout is going to be perfect, but that's not what we're going to be doing. We're going to talk, we're going to talk around those kind of things, but it's really, that's just a review to help you to be successful. Okay, thank you. Great question. Any others? All right, excellent. And I will see you guys all back here in 10 minutes.
So it looks like I, for that break, forgot to stop recording. So uh, as you're listening to this, I apologize for the five, six minutes or whatever you just had of silence. Uh, but we are uh, talking again. So here we're back. Any questions before we get started? Anything about the uh, macromolecules before we move on to the last little bit of business we need to deal with for today? All right, excellent. So the last thing we need to talk about for today is, like I said, we want to talk about histology, right? The study of microscopy, you know, the 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 mac, the the, the, uh, the, talk, the study of this material using a microscope. And I know one of the challenges we're going to have is that you're not going to be able to hold the microscope in your hand. Uh, but we're still responsible for understanding how microscopes work and understanding histology slides. Now, there are lots of ways that you can do this. Your textbook does a nice job of talking about these things. We'll do it as more as we go through it. But I want to remind you as you go to the modules of some of the resources that are there available for you. Now, hopefully, again, we've done all of our getting started stuff. So you can go ahead and minimize that to get that out of the way. Uh, and the first thing then you will see on your list are some of the important study tools. Uh, the last one here is, again, that open lab for tomorrow that I want to encourage you to go to. But we have four other links here as well. One is to our loop YouTube site where you can find our lectures. But I want to talk about these other three links. And I'm going to actually start with this one, the Virtual Anatomy Lab. This Virtual Anatomy Lab is uh, Niagara County Community College Virtual Lab. They've got a great site here when you go to it. Uh, that has things that we've talked about. Notice it's got body cavities, planes, and regions. And what's nice about it is it has it both labeled and unlabeled, so you can both learn and challenge yourself. Notice one of the things that it has here is the microscope. You are responsible for understanding the parts of a microscope and a general understanding of how magnification works. You can increase the size of these images and scroll around. Uh, you need to know the names of them and the basic anatomy. You don't need to know the physics of how it works and how it refracts the light. But we do need to have a basic understanding of magnification, how the oculars magnify, how the objectives magnify. And as you're working on unit three in your lab manual, even though you're not going to have a microscope in front of you, I want you to read the exercises that you would be doing for unit three. Uh, you don't necessarily have to fill them out. Remember, all you have to do is fill out the review questions and you don't actually have to do the microscope activities to do that. But I want you to read through them so because they help to give you an understanding of how a microscope works. So we have the parts, we have the different regions of it, and this is all testable material. You need to know the parts of the microscope. I could have a picture of a microscope with an arrow pointing at something like this, and you need to know that's the ocular lens. Uh, there's also some histology here, although the histology isn't as good on this one as some of the other sites we have. Uh, so again, we can see uh, epithelial tissues with it labeled, and it shows the different slides and has that. And again, you can go through and you can quiz yourself on the different things and things along those lines that we'll be doing when we get to the tissues as well. Although there's not a lot of cells here, but notice there's a lot of good information on this site. This is a really good site. The second site I want to talk to you about is the CRC. This is the Cosumnes River. They've got a virtual anatomy lab. Uh, we are in the process of doing one of these for American River College. Uh, what they've done a nice job of doing is taking pictures of some of the models and the charts, the materials in the classroom. And we're in the process of compiling that for American River College. We just had a lot more and they started a lot earlier than we did. Uh, but they have some nice things in here. For instance, under cell structure, the very first thing they have is a picture of one of the cell models that's in the classroom. And this is definitely something that is testable material. What's nice about this particular slide is, again, they will show you this with the uh, illustration unlabeled. And then if you click to the next slide, it shows it to you labeled as well. So it shows those. And it has most of the things we're responsible for. It doesn't, it, I don't, doesn't look like it has the peroxisomes labeled, but we'll talk about that when we get to it in our class as well. Uh, the rest of these are all electron microscopy views of the organelles. So those are nice as well. So here we see a mitochondria with the cristae and things along those lines. Uh, so this is a useful slide uh, that you can have as well with that a virtual anatomy lab from Cosumnes River. And like I said, we're in the process of working on something for this, uh, but I don't know how soon it will be ready. So hopefully it'll be ready in time for us for the muscular system in particular, uh, that would be super helpful, but uh, we'll see what we can do with things like that. 
Uh, and again, this is better for models, for charts, for things like that that are in the classroom, uh, as well as some of the bones and other things as well. Uh, for histology, the thing that I found that is the absolute best, and we'll go back to here, is again this Yale histology. In fact, this Yale histology is gonzo, way, way more information than you are ever going to be held responsible for in this class. So it can be a little overwhelming when you first look at it. So for instance, when you look at the cell, it has a whole lab with learning objective, keywords, most of these things you're not going to need to know. You don't need to know what osmium staining is, for instance, or proto plasm or aster or things along those lines. Um, uh, but uh, there are plenty of things like chromosome and spindle and nuclear envelope that you will need to know as well. Uh, but it's, uh, again, it's interesting information, talks about the organelles, talks about mitosis, there's a pre and post lab, and way down here at the bottom is where we have our slides. So for instance, we can look at the nucleus of a cell. Uh, and again, we can see that in the cell and it has all that information that is there in there, uh, some more uh, virtual micros uh, microscope slides that you can look at. There's some electron microscopy views. So for instance, when we get to the rough endoplasmic reticulum when we talk about it, we'll see that they're flattened interconnected membranous sacs with little globular proteins that are the ribosomes. And they have these am amazing, beautiful pictures of these things. Again, I want you to have a histology atlas because you'll get more variety, but I will tell you the stuff that's on this Yale site is pretty damn impressive. So I would encourage you to spend some time playing with this as well. Because again, this is a nice, perfect, beautiful example, right? And again, that's the key because when you do a web search, if you do a web search for rough endoplasmic reticulum, you will get some good pictures of endo, uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum, but you'll also get some crappy ones. You'll also get pictures of Golgi apparatus. You'll also get pictures of a nucleus. You'll also get pictures of somebody's pet dog named endoplasmic reticulum. And if you don't know what you're looking at, then you're not going to be able to tell what is real information and what is, you know, just crud. And so by having these perfect examples, these labeled examples to be able to identify and look at, like in a histology atlas, like on these websites, are things that are going to help you to be tremendously successful. So when you're looking at your epithelial tissues, like we're going to be looking at, and you want to see, like we talked about last time, what that pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue looks like, we're going to come here and click on pseudostratified and see a beautiful example with the cilia of that ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. And then you can go to the almighty Google and put that in as a search and see what you get as a result of that. So again, I want you to spend time looking at these, understanding what a microscope is, understanding what a microscope works, but most importantly, because after all, your goal is to be successful on this class, to be able to recognize and identify these things on a slide, because ultimately that's what this test is going to be. All right, as I mentioned, you're gonna to have to learn all the bones without holding a bone in your hand, but you're also not gonna be tested with that bone in your hand. You're going to be looking at pictures of bones. You're going to be tested on pictures of bones. You're going to be looking at pictures of tissues. You're going to be tested on pictures of tissues. You're going to be tested on pictures of cells. And here's the other thing, too. I don't want you just memorizing this picture. This is a great picture. And is it possible that I could use this picture on the exam? Absolutely. But your goal is not to just memorize this picture. Often when I am making an exam, what I will do is I will go to the almighty Google and type in what I need and see what I can find. Your goal is to learn this material, not memorize the pictures in the textbook, not memorize the pictures in the lab manual, not memorize the pictures on Yale's website. I have no problem showing you a novel picture of something that you could never have possibly seen before, as long as it is what I believe to be an obvious example. Like I said, my goal is not to be tricky. We'll talk about this more when we get to the cell. If we sneak back here uh, and talk about the cell and look at the cell picture, <clears throat> this cell model is pretty good for most things. There's a couple things that are a little wonky on here, and some of the things that are a little wonky, I'm not going to use this for. We have some other models that are equally wonky in other ways. Because that's the other thing you have to remember about this. Is this truly what a cell looks like? Is the nucleus really blue and the Golgi apparatus red? I know you're all asleep, but again, is the nucleus really blue in a cell? 
No. 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 no, exactly. What you are looking here is an artistic representation of what a cell is. And while I won't be so cruel as to say that artists get things wrong, what we'll say instead is that sometimes they take a little artistic license in what they're doing. They were more concerned about making it beautiful than making it accurate. So not every model is necessarily gonna be as accurate as we'd want it to be. And we'll talk about some of the examples like this stuff here and what this is and why this is a little wonky. Uh, but I will always use what I believe to be obvious examples of things. Cause like I said, I don't have to be tricky. This class is hard. So I will be straightforward. I will use obvious examples of things to hopefully so that again, you can show me you have the knowledge without the process getting in the way of you doing that. So again, as I talked about last class, and I want to talk to you about it here, one of the challenges of this class is now this would be the time when normally we would break up into, you know, individuals. Everybody here would be assigned a microscope. You'd have your own microscope that you were responsible for the care and feeding of. And everybody would take out microscope slides, and I'd be running around the room making sure everybody knows how to do this properly. The problem is there's no way for us to do this. One of the things that I talked about, your success in this class is gonna be determined by how self-driven you can be. Can you be disciplined? Can you uh, put the effort and time necessary to study these things? Again, you're not gonna have to do it all by yourself. We are gonna, on Monday, um, pardon me, I keep thinking it's a new week. On Thursday, because it is a new week, essentially on Thursday, uh, we will go through the cell anatomy together. We will talk about the cell anatomy and the cell structures and what they do and how to identify them and what they're all called and all those things. We'll go through the processes together, but uh, to master this material, you're going to have to rely on yourself to put the time and effort to make sure you do that because that's me just going through it once with you isn't necessarily gonna be enough. So you're going to need to make sure you put the time and effort. So I really want to encourage you as we go into the weekend, uh, and again, by weekend, I mean our one day off on Wednesday, and then come back on Thursday, which again, because the summer school is a brand new week's worth of information on Thursday and Friday. I want to really strongly encourage you to take advantage of these times to really be working on the material. At this point, you should already be ahead, looking ahead, learning about the cells, working on that, looking at mitosis if you've never learned mitosis before. And those, because those are the things that we're gonna talk about. Remember, you have that schedule that shows you the things that we're gonna be covering each day in class. So I wanna encourage you to be looking at this anatomy, working on these things and learning. All right. So those, again, are in your modules. Remember also, you have your uh, Labster, uh, 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 a lab that is due on Wednesday when you come back on Wednesday, uh, pardon me, Thursday when you come back. On Thursday, your unit review one is due. If you do not have your lab manual yet, remember, email me. Uh, and if you email me there your receipt that you've purchased it and it's back ordered, then I can make accommodations for you that way. But you wanna get that sooner rather than later. And then remember also on Friday, because it's quick turnaround, you also have your unit three, which is the microscope stuff and the cell stuff. And then also your second labster is due, uh, the mitosis one. So you guys have a busy couple days ahead of you uh, going into the weekend. All right. Questions on any of that? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. Are any of the homework assignments where we have to work as a group or not? For this section, no. When we get to the bones, uh, I'm going to put you together in groups uh, because, again, it's incredibly boring for me to just stand here, look at a picture of bone and say, this is the greater trochanter, this is the lesser trochanter, this is the intertrochanter line. Uh, so there are going to be some interactive activities that you will do as groups. But right now, I think we're just trying to get our feet underneath us in this process. So adding group activities on top of that right now wasn't something I was looking to do. But I will tell you, as we move from this section into the next section of the class, the second section of the class where we start talking skeletal system and muscle system, uh, there will potentially be some uh, group activities for that. Now, is there any way um, to contact any of the students in the class just in case try to get a hold of you but we we don't get an answer right away uh, do we have a list of the names and phone numbers or something like that uh, you don't have lists of names and phone numbers I believe you do have the you do have a way of seeing the students that are on the roster and emailing them but honestly the easiest way as I've seen as you, again over here on the tab if you come to the discussions 
Over here is a discussion board, what I've made, set up as the water cooler. This water cooler is where you can post, you can respond to this, you can put, put, put a post in here. So if you're looking for, for instance, a study group, or if you're having questions about a question, you know, like, hey, what did you guys forget for question one? I thought it was this, but it may be that. Now, you guys are welcome to interact on here. As it says for the water cooler, there are three things that are important to know about this water cooler. I do not monitor it. Okay, this I figure for you, for the students, for whatever you want. So if again, if you want to be non sequiturs talking about whether or not there's going to be baseball this year, great, you're welcome to talk about that. If you want to talk about how boring it is listening to this class or how you listen to my voice at night to help you go to sleep, that's fine as well. All right. All I ask is that you be respectful to each other. All right, be respectful of each other on this uh, discussion board. And most importantly, if someone is not being respectful, someone needs to let me know. Because like I said, I do not monitor this. So if inappropriate behavior is going on on the discussion board, I'm not gonna be aware of it. So someone needs to make me aware of it and I promise you I will resolve it, okay? This is your free space, use it however you want. So again, if you wanna form a study group where you guys set up your own Zoom meetings and wanna discuss this material, that's gonna be great. When we get to the group activities, you'll be assigned groups and this will be where you meet in the groups and the discussion board of this as well. But like I said, that's still gonna be a couple weeks away. But yeah, if you wanna form a study group or if you have a question, or theoretically, if you needed a couple pages out of one of the lab manuals, this would be the place where you would go, uh, theoretically, to ask something like that. All right, this is your guys' space. Use it how you need uh, to communicate with each other. Okay. All right, any other questions? Um, I did have one. For the homeostasis lobster? Yes. Uh, how was that graded? Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look at it. I think this should work. No, so hold on, wait. Modules. So here's the lobster. It's 20 points. It's submitting for an external tool. It's due by Thursday in the morning. So you're going to read the simulation. You're going to read the objectives. When you do all of that, you're then going to click lobster to load it. Uh, and again, I'm not in Chrome, so that's the so it won't do this. But what'll happen is it will load here. When you're doing it in Chrome, I'm not in Chrome on this one because uh, I'm logged in with my student account. So it looks like if it's Chrome, Firefox, or Safari, you'll go in and it's a virtual app. And when it's completed, it will submit to me. So there isn't any, so you don't have to do anything to submit it. You're just going to go through the activities that are on it as it loads and run through it that way. So, and again, you said is we give full credit for completing it, correct? Yes. So okay. again, you, it, you have to complete it successfully. Successful completion is doing 100% of the activities and I get getting at least 80% of the points. And I'll double check that to make sure because I've said it like three times now, I'll make it 80% if it isn't 80%. Unless it's less, then I'll leave it there. What happens is as you do the activities, there are points on it. So it may ask you a question. And if you get the question right, you get 100% of the questions, uh, the points for that question. If you get it wrong, then you have the opportunity to ask it again, to answer it again until you get it correct. And each subsequent answer gives you a little bit fewer points. So an, an, so an activity, and again, for this one, I don't remember how it is. This activity may have 100 points. This one has 70. I already went through and I was trying to learn how to do it. So I think I got 52 out of 70 or something like that. I just have a hard time understanding how to go through everything. Right. Well, and so that's why, that's why I've had this set up uh, since the beginning so that you have time to play with it. So the, mm -hmm. if, if, it should have told you whether you were successful or not at the end, but uh, so I haven't seen, I haven't looked, I haven't looked at it for my grade book. So I'll look at it and see if there's anything to that and I'll add to it. Now, if it need be, I will make an announcement on canvas and I'll send an email to everybody if there's something wonky about it. Uh, but uh, I'll look, I haven't actually looked at the grade book yet to see if anybody has completed it or how that comes up for me. So I will figure that out from my standpoint. This lobster is a brand new program. We just got three weeks ago, so I'm still learning it as well okay but yeah so it it does it 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 isn't super intuitive it does take a little bit of time but the one key to it is it always highlights what you need to do so if you need to go over for instance to a particular cabinet that cabinet will be highlight 
hi highlighted. So it, it does kind of help walk you through it. It's not super, super intuitive, but it is, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so it shouldn't be too bad. And the more you do it, the more, the more familiar you'll get with it. All right. Cool. Any other questions? Those are all great questions. Any more? All right. So with that, then I'm done with the lecture. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I know some people were having difficulty doing different uh, quizzes or programs or other things or having issues with. If that is the case, you're welcome to stick around and we will try to resolve those issues or you can send me an email and we can try to get it done later today or even tomorrow. All right. And again, like I said, if you had problems getting on the chemistry quiz, I have reopened the chemistry quiz up till 8 p.m. so that you can get in and complete it. Oh, uh, one last question. Uh, for the form, uh, the safety form, something yes, like that. Safety form, yes. Um, I submitted that in. You said some, you got some forms that were blank. Yes. So uh, if you look at your grade, if you got 10 points, then you did it correctly. The information was there and you don't have to worry about anything else. If you got a zero, then that means that there was a problem. If I haven't graded it yet, if it's still waiting to grade, then I just haven't gotten to it yet. Oh, okay. 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 All righty. Excellent. All right. Well, like I said, then I will go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, if there are any other questions or any other issues you guys are having, stick around and we'll see if we can work them out. We're finished a little bit early today. All right. But again, don't use this time to go celebrate. Start looking at the microscope stuff. Start reading about the microscope. Look at your chapter, uh, unit one, look at unit, everything in unit one, your review, you should be able to complete. So that definitely should be something you can do. Take a look at that. Start looking at the cells stuff and get prepared for Thursday. So I'll see you guys Thursday. Be safe, be healthy, and uh, have you. a good long one day weekend. Thank see you. Thursday. See you guys Thursday morning. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Thank you.